Welcome to the Monday, July 9th meeting of the Green Bay Planning Commission. Uh, first item on the agenda is roll call. Uh, President, or Chair Timothy Gilbert is here. Vice Chair Sid Bremer. Present. All the members, or all the persons, Veronica Corpus Tax. Present. Police Commissioner Lisa Hansen. Present. Commissioner Jacob Miller. Present. Commissioner Randall Petrovsky. Present. And Commissioner Jerry Rizkowski. Present. Next item, approval of the agenda for the <coughs> July 8th meeting. <coughs> Motion to approve. Tim? Yes. Question. Yes, Alderman Steyer. I don't know if I can make a request to move up item 7. So number one. I'm in another meeting right now. So I'm just well, we have to do the public hearing. <coughs> public hearing first. Okay. And then we that. probably should take a request right after it, so mm -hmm. we could move it up to number two for okay. regular business. Okay. That'll be all right. Thank you. And it's up to you guys. So no. move to approve the agenda with that change. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda as recommended. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next item, approval of the minutes of the June 11th meeting of the Planning Commission. I'd like to move to approve the minutes subject to correcting the property owner's name for item number one, I believe it's Stone Ridge rather than Stone Ride Holdings, uh, and also subject to the insertion for each item on the, uh, of the meeting, a timestamp for the uh, video record. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes per the change. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item, public hearing. This public hearing has been properly posted and public notification has been published in the Green Bay Press Gazette. The Planning Commission is interested in hearing public comments on the subject of agenda items. We invite your comments and ask that after your name has been called, you state your address, whether you represent a group or association, whether you favor, oppose, or are only providing information on this matter, and your comments of concern. We also ask that you confine your testimony to facts related to the proposal at hand and avoid repetitive testimony. You must be recognized by the Planning Commission in order to speak, and please address your comments to the Chair. <coughs> We will now open the public hearing on a request to revise properties located at 1003 Pine and 1000 Main Street from medium intensity retail office housing to commercial. Submitted by Ronald L. Smith, property owner. Is anybody. Well, well, so Stand. Would it help if we have the presentation by staff first? Um, to remind people of oh. we it's up to you. I can do a background be information if that it helps. may be beneficial. That's sure. what I'm thinking. Sure. <laughs> this request is a comp plan amendment um, from medium intensity retail office and housing to commercial. So the property is located, generally speaking, at Maine and Webster here. Um, it is currently uh, a used car sales business here, nearly new auto. Um, the plan is to expand that use further south. Um, the current zoning, let me just quickly run through the kind of plan. The kind of plan calls for that medium intensity retail office or housing. So there really is no other commercial land uses in this particular area, so this would kind of stand out with that land use change. Um, looking at the zoning map here, the, the red is the general commercial or the C1 zoning. Um, for that use to occur or expand, they would need a C2 or highway commercial zoning. So we need to change future land use to a commercial designation so they can go ahead and proceed with a rezoning. There is C2 adjacent here, but there is office residential zoning to further to the south. Um, there are some commercial developments north of Main Street. PDQ is to the east, mm -hmm. CVS is to the west. Uh, there are some Lower density residential to the south, and then Whitney School redevelopment and townhomes is kind of kitty corner of southwest from that particular area. Uh, 
Uh, so again, this is a change from medium intensity retail office or housing, which is kind of a mixed use district, to a straight commercial district, district which will allow the applicant to apply for rezoning to a district that would permit those auto sales to occur. So that's the general information. Okay. Thank you. Does anybody wish to speak on this? Yeah, thank you. My name is Ron Smiths, 3777 Mighty Oak Trail, Green Bay, Wisconsin. I'm the owner of the property. <clears throat> if it's okay, I'd like to uh, just present some pictures of present and future. <clears throat> T-bar of uh, the positives of uh, the change here <coughs> and um, you can see by the pictures I'd like to clean up a unattractive uh, property downtown Green Bay. I'd like to create more jobs by uh, promoting the growth of a small business. We can uh, create better than entry level paying jobs. <coughs> we can grow a uh, business without any, any major traffic changes here. We're not going to be a fast food restaurant or a Grand Central Station that's going to bring a significant amount more traffic to this intersection. Positive of working in conjunction, the city can work in conjunction with a small business that's uh, been successful on Main Street for over 30 years. I have uh, a lot of positive feedback uh, from the plans that I've showed you, including my uh, closest neighbor, which is Red Lewis of uh, PDQ Car Wash. He's uh, very excited about the change. <coughs> and he also mentioned um, when he remodeled the old Daniil Cadillac and turned it into the auto gallery, how a lot of his neighbors in the immediate area um, also changed their businesses for the good. We've had a lot of uh, positive feedback from other neighboring businesses. The, uh, the use will actually uh, make the whole square block here in uniform use with um, auto detailing and, and auto sales. We've received um, no negative comments from approximately 50 letters that we've sent out to uh, adjacent property owners and um, in the uh, immediate area. We, uh, we offered our cell phones and our email on there and, and uh, we've got uh, just positive feedback. We, uh, <laughs> we're a business that's not looking for city dollars. We're not looking for any TIF dollars or any grants that are available. This will be all self-funded. We've had positive feedback from the Main Street program. We've had positive feedback from the Alderman elected to our area. We've had positive feedback from the Whitney Park Group, positive feedback from the Whitney School developers. This change will help promote a business that collects more sales tax dollars per sale than any other business on Main Street. The bottom line is that um, this will be the best this property has ever used, uh, looked since the inception of the property. If you can hand this down, one of my customers brought the original property, picture of the property in from, I think that's the 20s or the 30s. From an economic standpoint, um, I think it'll be the best use of the property since the history of the property. The change will be good for the state, it'll be good for the city, it'll be good for small business, it'll be good for Main Street. It's a win-win-win for all parties involved. We had, a, uh, we had a meet and greet with the 50 letters that I sent out. Um, we just had a few people show up, but again, everything was positive. Questions? Yes. Just one. 
would the few people who showed up be, could be anywhere from three to 20, about how many? That showed up uh, for the meet and greet? Yeah. Out of 50 letters, we had two people show up. Okay. And I guess there was some other <coughs> people that, some other positive feedback that couldn't make the meeting that, mm -hmm. um, that came. We had uh, Jeff Marcus from the Main Street program, uh, Rick Chernick from Camera Corner. <coughs> I met with the aldermen, Randy Chanel. Uh, Garrett Bader from Whitney Park, Lance Ritt from uh, the Whitney Park um, Association. I met with Andy Nicholson. I met with uh, Glenn Sanderson. He owns Sanderson Photography. Um, I think it's a new Vestago with the Whitney School Project. I met with him. I met with Red Lewis. And uh, like I said, there's 50 other contacts that I have given our personal email and personal cell phones to with uh, no negative feedback. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak on this matter? Is there anybody else wishing to speak on this? Is there anybody else that wants to speak on this? Hearing none, this public hearing is now closed. Next thing is regular business. Item one, consideration and possible action on a request to revise property located <coughs> at 1003 Pine Street and 1000 Main Street from medium density and retail office housing to commercial. So many We're moving up. We're moving up. Oh, we're moving up. Oh, this one then. Oh. oh. Let me just uh, follow up on, I think, some graphics that you got. Uh, this is a site plan that was submitted, a central site plan from the applicant. Uh, this kind of shows Webster and Pine here. This is a portion of the building that would be left. There's a front portion that would be removed. So the idea here is that uh, this would be demolished and the parking lot would be improved and to obviously vehicle sales. So it would be based on an extension down to the south to Pine Street. I'm not sure if you have that graphic or not. This kind of is a better picture that shows that. So this is looking southeast. Uh, this is Webster and Main. This is the existing dealership here, uh, repair garage. And this is a portion of the building that would be kept uh, refaced, so to speak, with parking out front. So I just want to kind of explain that a little bit more. So as part of any sort of comprehensive plan amendment, there are a certain set of criteria that we use to evaluate, and that's included within the agenda tonight. Um, the concern that staff has with a commercial land use like this is we feel as it starts to intrude upon or protrude into the neighborhood. It's really not a compatible land use that we feel for the adjacent residential properties. Um, a change to a commercial land use might be a short-term fix here. We feel a better long-term fix would be the existing uh, land use that's recommended as part of the comprehensive plan, which is that medium intensity retail office and housing. Again, this color here for consistency with other properties in the area of the law for mixed-use development and be a better long-term option. Uh, we did notify property owners within a couple hundred feet here. We did notify Old Main of uh, the neighborhood associations. We really haven't received any calls or written comments on this, but uh, our re recommendation tonight is uh, denial of the request. Okay, so Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the zoning for PDQ? C2. That's the highway commercial zoning. So what's being requested here is the same zoning that is next door. It is. A, it's a land use category. So it would go to commercial. If that was approved, then it would come back for rezoning to highway commercial. So it would be a sister. It would be compatible extension of this zoning to that property if the land use so your concern about lack of compatibility has to do with the residential area south. South, south and southwest, yes. And southwest. So there's redevelopment going on with the school here, there's mm -hmm. existing residential on this area okay. here. And CBS, that is currently? C1. C1. Same zoning. Okay. So for all the mm -hmm. sales, all the repair, those are all kind of fall into that C2 category. It's a unique zoning to that particular type of land use. I want to be clear now. C1 for CVS. Mm -hmm. 
This is a request for. Oh right, we've got to do the top one. The it's a two-step process first, yeah. right? We got to prime them here. in order to lead to the C two, but it's not currently being requested. But PDQ is already C two. Right, and they have Correct. a long right. That's been there for I suppose a number of years. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. So all the red is commercial at this time. So that's the current zoning. Correct. But the comprehensive plan calls for that all to be mixed use. Over the long term, yes. But that would change to be a, more of a mixed use district. So commercial zoning is more of an intensive use. Right. Um, that's not to say you couldn't have some commercial as part of that mixed use development, but um, <coughs> that's not strictly commercial <coughs> corridor. Discussion among commissioners? Commissioner. I um, really appreciate the thoughtfulness of, of the staff's recommendation here and their approach to this. Um, but I am having trouble thinking why, understanding why something that is next to a current highway commercial should not also move in that direction, particularly because this half block is between the CVS and the PDQ. Um, I do understand that the comprehensive plan is forward-looking, but the CVS is pretty new, and as Paul said, PDQ has been there for a very long time. Um, and this is an owner who has shown himself to be uh, concerned with the appearance of things, and I do appreciate that very much. Um, I'm not sure that a kitty corner sales lot across from the new Whitney uh, development is particularly concerning. If it were right across the street like that, I would feel somewhat differently, but that kitty corner makes a difference. So that's kind of where I am at this point, and I'm eager to hear what my <coughs> colleagues have to say. I tend to agree with your, your view. Um, I, again, I understand the comprehensive plan wants us to remain medium intensity retail office housing. But uh, there's nothing to say that in the future we couldn't rezone it to that if it presented itself. But yeah, I, I also don't see the big concern with changing this to commercial. Especially since everything along that is already, already commercial. Any other discussion? Alderman Starr. Thank you, Chair. Paul, could you put that site plan up again? Mm -hmm. Or the gold, the, the oblique on there. You know, I, I guess my first reaction looking at this is that there's a lot of parking right on that corner, and it is <coughs> such a vital corner in the downtown area. And I guess, was there any consideration by the owner to look at a different configuration of, of the property? Have the building maybe closer to the intersection. Well, the building or is the building sorry. exists. Mm -hmm. not, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, the building is existing. I mean, it really mm -hmm. absolutely wouldn't be feasible mm -hmm. to move the building. And I'm attempting to remove what some could possibly consider the uh, a blighted building that's there now. And um, it's. Um, it's not like I'm trying to buy this property subject to, I've owned it for a number of years, and um, there, at this point, there really are, there are no other options. I don't have mm -hmm. another plan. I'm not, if this doesn't happen, I'm not gonna sell the property. I'm just gonna keep it, and it's been used as a, a power tool, tool building and warehousing for uh, the past 50 years. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I can see the conundrum or some of the problems that might happen if you're looking to rezone and you're looking at the comprehensive plan because, you know, we are, you know, we're doing plans along Gulp and we did it along military and university and 
Main Street and we're looking at, you know, in the future, you know, but a lot of times things come up and you have to deal with it accordingly and then, but then it kind of seals the deal a little bit. So, you know, if you, if this goes through, that will seal the deal for that property. But it, it's, it's difficult when you plan, when, when, with planning. You might say five years down the road, maybe ten years down the road, something else may come forward that would be a little, a little more beneficial, if you will, or, or a little more adherent to the to that area. But um, I understand that you're limited, but I'm just, I'm not fully convinced yet, but I you know, I think you, you made a good presentation. So let me see if that pans out. Thank you. I have. Thank you. Commissioner Hanson. So, remind me again, how many years out are the smart growth plans? The comprehensive plans in 20 years. I guess how many years was this one starting out to be? Yes, 20. 20. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I mean, as much I love <coughs> mixed use properties, um, but I also have a really hard time telling a current business owner that they can't expand their property when there is property available and vacant right next door to theirs. Um, I don't know, especially since you look at the current zoning and it's just a sea of commercial. Um, I don't know, I feel like I would support the, the comprehensive plan change. Yes, Commissioner. First, I'd like to, I think it's appropriate to disclose that I own one of the Whitney Park townhouses that's immediately on the other side of the CBS, so I don't have a direct financial interest in this property, but probably a tangential one. I think it's appropriate to put that on the record. Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear a little bit more from staff on the distinction between C1 and C2, mm -hmm. um, because that may be important, it may not, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about that to refresh the, yeah. the definition. So C1 is more of the general commercial district allows offices, retail, personal service, business service uses, so a wide gamut of uses that can occur there. The C2 zoning, the highway commercial, is more narrow towards drive-through facilities, gas stations, and auto vehicle sales, and repair. Uh, it's really more dependent on the auto use, so to speak. So there is a distinction between those two. In that corridor, uh, are the majority of those businesses currently C1, so the more general use, as opposed to C2? I think that's fair, yes. There are some C2s that you might find some gas stations on, mm -hmm. maybe a car lot or two, but generally it's C1. Does the staff feel that C1 is more consistent with the plan than C2 would be? I think it would, I think with the proposed land use, a mixed use zoning would be a more appropriate a neighborhood center. Mm -hmm office residential type of use. It is could be a candidate for a downtown zoning, but there's really no adjacent downtown zoning. So it's probably an office residential or neighborhood center is more a better candidate. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, Commissioner Miller. Uh, Paul, just to confirm, there was no comment from Old Main Street, Inc., or the neighborhood district, Whitney Park District? I received no formal comments. I did talk to Jeff Merkis today. They, they were non-committal on their... This is not part of the Old Main Street District. Oh, okay. It's adjacent to, so it happens okay. to be... Breaks right at that southern line, so... Uh, but they didn't offer a, a recommendation. Uh, I guess my thoughts on it are probably similar to a lot of the other commissioners here. Um, I think we could all agree that this is not the highest use that we'd like to see for any area adjacent to downtown, but at the same time, um, it, it's surrounded on both sides by fairly comparable uses. Um, I guess I, I also feel comfortable allowing it to go to C2, simply because it's not putting us in a situation where it's something we can't come back from. Uh, it's not like we're changing to a use that would put up something that wouldn't be able to be fixed later on. Um, that's the nice thing about parking lots is you can always build on top of them. So I don't feel too uncomfortable that we're going to be put in a situation five years, ten years on the line where we can't undo it if the market states that something else should be there. So um, that being said, I, I kind of agree with just what I read so far. Thank you. 
Commissioner Wojcicki. Kind of uh, in agreement with what I'm hearing here, basically. Yeah, I have a hard problem, uh, and I'm going to set the pace for the evening, I guess, uh, of turning people down who want to improve things, <laughs> and any improvement is a great improvement. This is not really a parking lot. This is a display. <laughs> Of all the cars, as far as I can see, am I correct on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's no different. If you drive by CVS um, at four o'clock in the afternoon, that parking lot is full of cars from one end to the other. Mm -hmm. I want to do the same thing here. I just want my cars for sale. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I guess uh, I can see it more as a display area, not a parking lot. So I kind of dispel that thought. Uh, but the same token, getting back to what I originally said here is that I'm all for development and. It's his property. He's come with a great plan, and uh, I'm sorry. Let the man uh, make his living and clean things up. He's cleaning it up. I think that's more important than anything else. And I would say that maybe in the future, maybe he'll put a high rise there or something. But uh, who knows? But uh, you never really know what they're going to really come up with. But for now, I think this is the best that we've got to deal with. Him. Let's quit chasing these people who are away that want to develop things and, and improve things. Uh, uh, I've seen too much of that in my tenure, and uh, I, I see nothing wrong with it. I really don't. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Commissioner Parker Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm in agreement with everyone else as far as um, allowing him move forward with this. My issue with it is that now we have a block that is all cement. Mm -hmm. There's no green space here. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that something that we could look at instead of just having one big cement block, one big cement lot? <coughs> is that something that you know, can we add some green space here? Well, we uh, certainly uh, want to sorry. maintain the uh, green sorry. space. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I thought she was directing. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry. That's something we have to just mm -hmm. the staff and just mm -hmm. want to open up the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, just one point. Um, the northern part of this plan is existing. Is it? Pre existing. As it is. So it doesn't show here. Yeah, the only change would be the southern part. So I don't know if we could make any demands or requests upon the northern okay. part. I wasn't sure if that was across the street or not. And right now, this item is strictly changing the comprehensive plan. Correct. So that wouldn't. We're not reviewing the site issues. It's just for your information that this is a concept of what it could look like. Right. Mm -hmm. So in the future, we would have, we'd be able to deal with that aspect of it. Well, it, it would just come down to staff and the ordinances that are in place. So if this goes through, a rezoning occurs, and then a site plan is submitted after that. If it meets code, then it's it's good to go. Just a second, though. If rezoning occurs, that if would be occurs. a next step that would come to the Planning Commission, right? It would, but mm -hmm. you wouldn't have the oversight on the design necessarily. It would be a straight it's rezoning safe. from C1 to C2, mm -hmm. and the codes would just kick in. Right? It would be an opportunity, however, to discuss with the owner the possibilities of increasing the green space in the part of the lot that's being redeveloped, and particularly the boundary and the cost of the single-family homes. You could, but you couldn't put any conditions on those. I understand. Yeah. Yes. But in any case, that's a future yep. agenda. Okay. Okay. Does the C2 call for any green space? It does. It does. 20%. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Bennett, do you have anything else to No. Nope. Commissioner West uh, I'd like uh, clarification. Uh, what's before us right now is uh, to uh, declare this as a commercial C, and it's the path to becoming C2. Is that what correct? It's a, it's a generalized commercial land use, mm -hmm. what you're considering at this point. And that's what we're addressing tonight. Just right. the future land we're not, use. We're not that. addressing the C2, but this is the pathway to it. Correct. Okay. I would uh, like to make a motion to approve uh, changing this to C2. Or C, rather. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll second that amendment to the, uh, uh, the comprehensive plan. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Very none. I ask that you place your vote.
I, I don't have a pop-up. We haven't. Oh. Nope. I, I have nothing. I did once I went back to the agenda. I'm back on the main page of the agenda. So I just call a voice vote. We're going to call a voice vote on this matter. Mm -hmm. All those in favor of the recommendation? They can put up a say aye. Recommendation and motion. And a motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion passes. Yes. Thank you. Next item is item seven, which we moved up. <coughs> Consideration of possible action on a request to amend the city. Green Bay Zoning Code Section 13-1500 and Section 5 of 13-200 is related to historic preservation. Thank you. So you're probably wondering why you're looking at the Historic Preservation Code since you are the Planning Commission. But the Historic Preservation Ordinance is housed underneath the Zoning Code, so to get any approvals and amendments to that, we have to go through your body. So kind of some background information on our Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, right now they operate on monthly meetings and they are an advisory committee only, meaning that you are required to go before them if you're doing any exterior work to a historic property, but you are not required to follow their recommendations. Mm -hmm. So in theory that should run pretty well, but in practice it's a little clumsy. Um, a lot of property owners don't really feel it as a required step, so they try to sneak by without getting the approvals done. The meetings are hard to do because they're only monthly, so in the summer when people are doing a lot of work, it's really difficult to get people in for the meetings. So over the past couple of years, it's been really hard work for property owners to get in line with the city's process. So last year, we put some staff people on to the commission to try to get it to run a little bit more effectively and try to see where the big holes are. So with that, we've kind of gone through and revamped what the process should be, and then from there, updated the ordinance to adjust to those needs from both the property owners and what the city would like out of the commission itself. So right now, as you're looking to get a building permit for any exterior work on a house, if you have a historic property, you're told you have to go for the HPC. Those meetings are held monthly, and with that, you get only the advisory review. So it kind of feels like you're waiting for a whole month for something that you could just do anyway. So with the proposed process, we're hoping that we will be able to do the building permit application still, so you'd still be required to do anything with our other municipal codes. And then from there, you would have the availability to go to a new reformed landmarks commission, which I'll discuss later, or have a staff review available so that we can get a faster permit. So that way for the smaller projects, you're able to come in, have staff review, and usually within 24 to 48 hours, you'll be able to get that building permit. And then from there, the review would be binding. So you'd have to have what we would call a certificate of appropriateness in hand to get your building permit to say this was approved by the historic body. Now you can get your building permit and do the work. Um, if you look in the staff report, we have some information about the comprehensive plan. Within the comprehensive plan, there was quite a bit of information about wanting to have a more effective and active role of our HPC. Um, with that, they're also looking to do some different updates. We were advised in our comprehensive plan to make it from advisory to binding, but even in the comprehensive plan, it said if you're going to do binding, don't make it very restrictive. The community's not in favor of that. So we really took that into consideration while writing this ordinance update. They also had some other ideas for us that would be pretty financial dependent. So we would do new intensive surveys. Ours is older than I am, so it's not very effective anymore. Um, doing literature drops, doing educational outreach, those sorts of things. But all those have a financial impact that the city just can't burden without additional support. So what we're looking to do, it's kind of a three-step thing. 
So there are some technical updates to this. This code hasn't been revised in years, so there's a lot of state statutes we had to catch up with, renaming some of the things that we work on. But the three major points would be the first one, we want to create a Landmarks Commission. So this ordinance would disband our HPC as it exists now, and then we'd be reformed as the Landmarks Commission. Uh, we would be able to go to two meetings a month, similar to the Plan Commission and a lot of our other commissions, or we could stay at one meeting a month, or just do double in the summer, because people are doing more work in the summer. But with that, we'd be adding some other requirements. So right now, we still require a registered architect, a historian, a real estate broker, an alder, and three citizen members. So we've had adjusted this a little bit to add the option for a licensed contractor or a licensed appraiser in case you know we have some faults getting professionals in the community to want to be a part of this. And then we've also bumped it up so the citizen members of those, two of those would have to reside in a historic property or own that historic property. So that gives people who have a lot more of a vested interest in historic properties and also know the cost of construction on historic properties, the ability to help out their neighbors with this process. So I think this is probably the biggest selling point for the new ordinance update is that right now, I mean, we're running three members short on our HPC. Some of them don't live in the city, so they don't really have a an interest in the community. This would make sure that professionals are on that board, that's mayor appointed, and that also that people who are their neighbors and who understand how historic properties are operated are also making those decisions for them. Uh, the second major change would be that we would allow staff approvals. So right now, every single thing that happens on the exterior of a historic home has to go before our HPC. So you can think of how frustrating that must be if you want to like put up a fence. You have to wait a month to do that. If you want to change out some shingles that you had roof damage, you have to wait a whole month to do that. So with this, this is the comprehensive list of what we would be able to do as staff. So the staff would be myself and then Jason Flatt, who's our historic preservation specialist. Um, it could be anybody within our department though. So if Jason and I got into a horrific accident, we all died, somebody would be able to do it for us. But this would be the staff approval one. So people would be able to come in, they would have to have the application, the specs of the project. We review those based off of what information we have about their property. And then these would be the things they'd be able to do right away. So most communities offer staff approvals where it's for very small things, like some of the repair work, some fence work, <coughs> storm windows. Ours, we've added quite an extensive list of things that a lot of people do in the city. So that we're making sure the most applications that we receive are the things that the staff can do in their own time. But this list is amendable, so if there's anything that you see that you think that should be something that historic property owners should be able to get approval for very quickly, this would be the part of the ordinance that's probably going to have the most flexibility, so that way we can see as people come in and make those applications, which ones we need more of and which ones we need less of. So the other part of this is that um, the city of Green Bay is not a certified local government, and what that means is that there are a variety of communities within the country, specifically in Wisconsin, there are certified local governments that mean that we have a binding design review, so we are able to do in-house reviews of historic preservation projects. If you are a certified local government, you are um, open to $25,000 worth of grant funding each year. So it's not taxpayer dollars, it's not even state taxpayer dollars, this comes from the federal government. It's earmarked from, I believe, oil reserves. So a small portion of that, like less than 1%, is reserved out to go to certified local government communities. So with all the things in our comprehensive plan that they recommended us doing that we just don't have the budget for, this $25,000 annually can help us fix that gap. So you apply for the projects for what you'd like to do, how much money you think it'll cost, and then each year they divvy up that between the Wisconsin areas. They also have our technical assistance, so if we have a large project, like say when the Northland first started, we could have had someone from the office come and offer us technical assistance for our HPC to say this is what you should be doing with this property. Along with having architects and engineers and all those things, these people are specifically trained to help municipal governments with technical assistance. Also, there's a lot of information out there about how having historic ordinances, specifically binding ones, they can really help you maintain or increase your property values. So they do a lot of research and have a lot of data that isn't available to all municipalities. So certified local governments get this information about their own municipalities and municipalities that are like them throughout the state. So having that information I think would be very helpful. So the process for this would be that if we would have our commission created or recreated as the Landmarks Commission, we establish this binding ordinance through this process, we apply with the State Historic Preservation Office, and then from there they accept you into the program and then you can apply for those monies. So that would be the CLG process. Something to keep in mind here, um, a lot of times when people think that we're going to do the binding ordinance is that we're changing a lot of what we already do, but in theory everyone is supposed to already apply to this department on any sort of historic preservation projects. They would get the approval, they would get the review done. Um, this is just adding a, like a level of credibility in my opinion, because we're going to staff with more professional people who work in the field. We're going to have people who are their neighbors. 
and we aren't outright prohibiting anything. There are a lot of historic preservation ordinances that would say you can't do vinyl, you can't redo your windows, those sorts of things. We don't have anything like that. This is the least binding ordinance that we can possibly propose and still get served by local government status. So um, in our department, we've created these little cheat sheets that we call them. So each property, we have all the defining features of that property, the architectural style, and then also any work that's already been on, done on the property. So if we say, those windows have already been replaced, go ahead and replace them. You know, it won't be that big of a deal versus if you just can't replace your windows in an ordinance, it kind of screws up everybody's process. So we just look at these, it'll all be case by case. So each house is different. So a property owner say, well, can I do this? It kind of depends on what your house is. How old is it? What are the defining features? Is it next to a house that has the same types of defining features and those are original and you're going to change yours out to be really noticeable? These are the things that we're going to be looking at. Another thing that's really important to remember is that Green Bay is Wisconsin's oldest city, and I think that we forget that a lot. Um, we don't really celebrate a lot of our historical value or integrity because a lot of the buildings, we just assume that the property owners will be able to protect them on their own. This app offers a certain level of protection to stop this from happening. So these are some of our established districts, most specifically Aster. Everything that's here in pink has already been demolished or destroyed. So we're trying to stop the loss of historic value within our own community because once we have the CLG status, we can apply for money for different tourist events, educational opportunity and outreach. When you're part of a certified local government, you can use this as a tourism base, basically. So being the oldest city in Wisconsin, we should be utilizing this more. We really just don't have the funds or the staff or the ordinance to back us up to do those things. So along with protecting existing properties and property values, we just kind of want to stop the general loss of historic value within our city. So with that, we did have a public meeting. I have met with the Astor Board, which is the largest of our, they hold 76% of our historic properties, the Astor Neighborhood Association. So I met with their board, the Neighborhood Association. We've had a public meeting, all these with relatively positive feedback. Um, there are a lot of people that think that this outright infringes on property rights, just the same as any municipal code, that anything would be further in position. Um, I tend to disagree only because I think that it is very important that people have a certain amount of safehood and being able to purchase into a historic district. So when you buy into that property, you buy into a neighborhood, you know that your neighbors cannot destroy the integrity of your home by destroying the integrity of theirs. So I know that there are some people in the audience that are here for this event, and Mark Sawyer is our chair of the HPC. I'm sure he's got a lot to say about it. He's been very passionate about historic preservation in the city for a number of years. I've been working on this specifically for about a year and a half. So if you have any questions, I can talk about this for about six hours straight, but <laughs> <laughs> I won't do that to you all. So you do have a copy of the clean ordinance that we're proposing, and then the draft is showing you the changes, but again, most of those are just technical updates, changing the names out, those sorts of things. And then also we provided a quick fact sheet, this one that was in there. This is what we handed out to the neighborhood associations, people who came to the public meeting, those sorts of things. So with that, we are requesting approval of your request. Thank you. Any discussion? Commissioner Tupelski. Uh, I have a question as it regards to the unilateral um, approval process. Is that is the unilateral decision restricted to approvals, or would the staff be, uh, on a unilateral basis, able be able to deny requests? Any COA that would be on this list, so anything that would come before us on this, we could approve or deny. If staff level is denied, it can be appealed to the Landmarks Commission, and then anything can be appealable to the City Council. Okay. So all these wouldn't just automatically go to the City Council like some of our items do. These would just be going to the Landmarks Commission, but everything is appealable to the City Council. So even if we have the ordinance in place and city council is generally like, no, that was a terrible idea, they can appeal every decision and it wouldn't degrade our ability to be a CLG. So essentially the, the staff approval process doesn't create more bureaucracy, it creates a, a quick answer to property owners who are looking to make a minor change. <coughs> yes, so even if they come in and we are adamantly opposed to something, they can still bring it to the next meeting and have the Landmarks Commission be their advocate as well. But and if not, then it could also go to the city council. But perhaps more importantly, if someone, if you, if it's conforming, um, they can just get a basically a stamp. You're good to go, and you don't have to wait to go through the commission. Okay. Yeah, it would Thank be you. an immediate approval, basically, depending on staff time. So I see it says painting of existing unpainted brick. What about non-brick houses? Then they wouldn't have brick. Well, right, but painting. <laughs> I'm just. I'm, just like, <laughs> maybe I'm not understanding. <laughs> Painting in general, just of a wood-sided house. That we consider that general maintenance. So we wouldn't have any, I mean, if you have orders to paint your house because the paint is peeling, you wouldn't have to come to us to fix that. Right. 
so we won't do any color choices or telling you what type of paint to use or anything oh, like that. Oh, so this is only if you have original unpainted brick. So even gotcha. if you had painted brick, we would have to stay in that. Okay. First of my questions follows directly from that because I thought at one point that I read, and this was a lot of paperwork with no paper. Yeah, <laughs> I'm still imagine. struggling with that. Mm -hmm. um, I thought there was something about uh, maintaining the visual appearance of the historic structure, and color of paint can have a lot to do mm -hmm. with that. So when we got to the later point that said that, uh, or the quick fact sheet that said that the paint color or painting would not be uh, under the purview of, of the staff or sure. the uh, Landmark Commission. I, I got confused about that. So what we do, this is pretty much across the board with a lot of um, any sort of like historic preservation commission or anything that oversees historic preservation. Doing the color is really far overreach in my opinion, only because yeah, it might make it look worse, but we also, I think that's an individual property rights thing, that people should be allowed to paint their home whatever color they want to paint it, even if it is a historic home. There are some larger historic areas, like if you go to New Orleans, they monitor everything because mm -hmm. that's kind of their thing. But for a code like this, I mean, even when I worked in Beloit, that's a pretty strict CLG area, and they didn't monitor color. They gave suggestions and recommendations that people would come to them to utilize that. But when it comes to painting, we typically just let people do what they would like to do. The same thing with picking the materials. As long as it's appropriate for the home, we're not going to say you can or cannot use this, but you guide someone in the right direction. If they're going to go from original wood to vinyl, we're going to say, please don't do that. But also, if you want to, you could keep the original wood on there, put new vinyl on it in case somebody wanted to come back later and take the vinyl off and restore mm -hmm. that wood. You know, there are a lot of creative solutions. It really just depends on the house. Mm -hmm. But also when it comes to maintenance, we have a clause in here that you can do all the maintenance that you want as long as it's the identical appearance of what you're changing out. I certainly appreciate the flexibility that has been built into this in, in many di different ways. And I'm glad to see us moving in a direction of, of valuing our historic properties. I should say, uh, first as a matter of, of personal reference, I taught in an urban studies department largely because of my awareness of uh, the cultural history of cities and how that impacts people and that sense of continuity in history. Mm -hmm. The feeling that your city does not just radically change on you overnight is one of the most important positive aspects of people's feelings toward their cities. So I think this, the general move here is, is right on. In keeping with that historical piece though, could you put up again the um, proposed people who would be on the commission? Oh. Hmm. I don't understand why a historian or a licensed contractor. I could understand a registered architect or a licensed contractor, but it would seem to me that a historian would be kind of necessary. So we go back and forth on this quite a bit. Um, the Jason isn't here because he's in Scotland for the summer because yeah, he has to do something. Okay. <laughs> um, he is a historian and he's on our staff. So right now we're filling in. We also have the caveat that if one of these roles can't be filled, the mayor can make an appropriate change out of the different profession. Um, but the registered architect is kind of across the board that that's a requirement. And we also, the historian we thought was really important as well. And a licensed contractor is usually really hard to come by with someone who lives in a historic property or lives in Green Bay or knows historic renovations very well. So we thought between the historian and the licensed contractor, those two are pretty hard to come by. So we thought one of the two should be on there, but mm -hmm. asking for both is going to be really hard to fill. So basically that was just looking at the availability in the city to think okay. we don't have a lot of those people here. So we wanted to make sure that this was an easy list to fill as well, because this might already be hard to do. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner mm -hmm. uh, Is this unique with uh, just the Green Bay area or is this uh, throughout United States or whatever, is, uh, the, they have these types of commissions most likely? Yes, yeah, certified local governments are throughout the United States. Okay. So Wisconsin, the closest one is De Pere. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, does it uh, go to city council for final approval also like everything else does? This ordinance change would, but the actual applications themselves wouldn't. Uh, the recommendations basically, I guess. Uh, do they go to city council for approval? We don't have it written that way right now. Oh, okay. We could, but then it just prolongs another meeting, especially because City Council only has one meeting in the summer, and we would want to double our meetings in the summer. So I don't know that that would help anybody. I think it would just make it a longer process. Because right now they don't go to City Council. Our HPC does not report okay, to them. Okay, so this is going to be a unique uh, commission that just does 
makes the decision, and that's it. And then it'd be appealable to counsel if they don't agree with that decision. Okay. Oh, it could be appealable. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yes. Translation, Lisa? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Other than that, hearing none, the chair would a motion to open the floor. Motion to open the floor. Second. We have a motion and a second to open the floor. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Alderman has a question. Yes. Alderman Stoyer. Thank you, Chair. Ready? Yes. I kind of hurt my feelings when uh, Stephanie. Well, I, Stephanie and Jason Flatt have done a fantastic job on this, and I'm very proud of it. And I do chair the Historic Preservation Commission. But when she said that she's younger than the <laughs> previous document, I actually worked on that document. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's okay. I didn't take it first. Um, I could talk six hours on this as well. I won't do that. But I, I will say that... Um, there are almost 70 certified local governments in the state of Wisconsin right now. We are not one of those. And being the oldest city um, in Wisconsin, I really feel that we need to look to that. I think in, all too often in this city, it's been half, half empty versus half full when we, when we talk about our historic structures. And folks have lived in the city and have seen things develop or come down over time. So we, back in the late 80s, I moved to Green Bay in 1981, and I was part, I worked in the planning office, and we went out and put pictures of old homes, and we, we went in front of committees, we went in front of Astor, the Astor Group, and we tried to appeal to them, you know, for an ordinance. We had a lot of property owners that, don't you tell me what to do with my house. So we learned a valuable lesson over a couple of attempts to try to do this, and I think the way we're doing it is the correct way. We've taken our time, we've done our research, and uh, like Stephanie said, it's not as binding as you would think. I think a lot of times people think with the, with the Historic Preservation Ordinance, it's gonna be, don't you dare tell me what to do. But the Landmarks Commission that would be set up would be a professional group that is skilled in, in many ways, and you could go to them for advice. So many times you might be able to talk to somebody before it even gets to a meeting state, and they can help you along with it. And I would think that most people that live in a historic district or historic home already have a sense of history in their community, and they want to make sure that it, it's correct for the, for the entire area. I guess the one slide, it is a bit of a shock when you talk about Aster, you know, 15% of the homes have been raised or altered appreciably. Granted, it's near the hospitals and near the river, but like I said, you get to a point where, you know, who's to say that it's not going to come down here and creep down here, and before you know it, you don't have a district anymore. So, um, you know, the quick fact sheet that she brought together, I'll just, you know, the Landmarks Commission is very important, and I think you would have a professional group of people that could really help with that. Um, I think the fact that we are not a certified local government, once we are, we'll be able to apply for various grants. We do need another intensive survey, if you will. We did this back in 1987-88, so you know how old Stephanie is. Um, anyway. Oh, how old Stephanie is. <laughs> Cheryl, you, you came weird. into the office about that no. time. Yeah, that's fine. But anyway, um, and I worked on that, we drew maps, we did all sorts of things, we did a lot of research on this, but it's history, so technically a lot of that information is still pertinent, but over 30 years, there's quite a few uh, structures that have come down. And, you know, so my thought is, you know, I'm all, we're always about adaptive reuse, if we can take a property and bring it forward, and we recently just put together a, a downtown east side historic district. So that was very good news, I feel, for the city of Green Bay because, you know, we got to a point where, uh, you know, the downtown changed, you know, quite a bit years ago in the 60s and 70s. And now we're looking at it the other way. You know, we're, we're starting, there's a paradigm shift going on, and I think we need to continue with that. Um, I'm also on the Brown County Trust for Historic Preservation, and we're looking at a, the entire county. I don't know if uh, Jean, Jean is here. I, when we opened the floor, Jean Hackbarth 
uh, works on the DePure Commission, and they've had quite a few successes, and I just want to follow their lead on some of the things we're doing, and I think that it's very important that we do that. I'm just going to say one quick quote, because I could talk on this indefinitely. I don't want to do that. I have another meeting. It's probably over by now. Uh, this was uh, a quote by English socialist William Morris. <clears throat> he wrote years ago, he said, these old buildings do not belong to us only. They belong to our forefathers, and they will belong to our descendants unless we play them false. They are not in any sense our own property to do with as we all like with them. We are only trustees for those that come after us. So buildings can't talk. You know, we're their spokespersons, if you will. So I think that it's important that we move forward. I think that the work that Stephanie and Jason did is fantastic, and I would... Uh, as city council president and alder, I'm, I'm going to push for this very hard at council. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. My name is Gene Hackbar, and I'm. I live at 933 Oakdale Avenue in the pier, mm -hmm. in a house that is within the um, Oakdale Historic District, Randall Avenue Historic District. Love it. I've also been actively involved, as Mark said, in Brown County Trust for Historic Preservation and have been serving uh, for seven years now on the Piers Historic Preservation Commission. And one of my sidelines is, and I'm getting to strongly supporting this, one of my sidelines is I serve as the president of the Wisconsin Historic Preservation Commission. Okay. Taking into account all of those things, I too want to applaud city staff for the effort that they have put into bringing this recommendation to you tonight. The efficiencies that are, um, that are part of this, the effectiveness that other communities have found in uh, these types of uh, uh, commission activities or landmark commission programs is extremely important. It's also important for the city of Green Bay, it seems to me. The history, the cultural elements that this city has within the entire state, within the nation, if you will, is really important to embrace and to say to the community, this is important. Your house, your commercial property is important. We're here to work with you effectively, efficiently, and to the best of our ability to get the word out that we're happy to be part of this community, the oldest in the state of Wisconsin. I strongly support it. Okay. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak on this matter? Yes. I do. <laughs> Hi, I'm Cheryl in your wig. I'm here with two hats. One being the unfortunate person who's probably responsible for taking a lot of these properties out a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> and taking out, unfortunately, a lot of other properties in the city of Green Bay. Because they have been left to really go bad, rot. We had just recently had to take one down and ask her, broke my heart, but the water had damaged it to the point that it needed to be removed. So I fully support this to help try to save some of these old historic houses um, that, are, that we have in, in the districts right now. The other hat that I wear is um, I live in Astor at 626 South Jackson. So my house is about 120 years old. We bought it in 90. And then we spent the past approximately 30 years restoring it. Um, we just put the front porch back on a couple of years ago, which was a labor, capital L, of faith. Um, so my concern as a property owner in Astor is that I'm investing this money in my house and next door to me, they could pretty much do whatever they want to it, which would depreciate my value. I really thought, you know, as I moved into Astor, that there already was a CLG 
a long time ago. Um, because quite frankly, I would have probably purchased an Eastie Pier if I could have, where I was protected for the historic district. I mean, let's face it, this is this is it. This once Aster is gone, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Fort Howard um, was reviewed. It the was Fort Howard neighborhood was reviewed, and it lost its eligibility because of all of the work that's been done there in a bad way. So, I know. I thought we could get that one just right in there. Exactly. And vinyl side. So I, I really hope you support this um, to protect the district. Um, again, Alderman Stoyer, I was going to say the same thing. We own our houses, but let's face it, our house will be there longer than we are. So it's really important that some other entity comes in and protects those structures in our historic districts. Support the CLG. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak on this? Is there anybody else? Okay. Hearing that, no. I'll close the meeting. I'll close the floor. Any further discussion on the staff? Commissioner Wisbisky. Motion approved. <laughs> second. Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve. I just want to say, as a history buff myself, my, one of my ancestors settled here in 1818, 200 years ago. After. And you're one of your best long lots on the east side of town. Mm -hmm. So I can fully appreciate your efforts. And I call them. It's not taking that long, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second to approve. Any further discussion? I just want to thank staff for all the work that you've done on this because it, it looks pretty amazing. And share our thanks with Jason. Oh. Even if it's <laughs> wedding house back, that's all. No. Okay. okay. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 I have to vote on this. Yeah. I have to vote on this. possible action on a request to amend the previously approved conditional use permit to allow a car, wa car wash in a community center commercial district located at 1053 Belp Avenue, submitted by Kurt Pollinger, Stone Ride Holding, LL. Stone Ridge should be done. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a request to amend a previously approved CUP at 1053 Belt. And again, this is Atkinson and Belt Avenue here. This is the gas station in question. Uh, this is before the Planning Commission in May and in June. Uh, the request had changed during that time. The original mm -hmm. approval was on the west side of the building, as you might recall. Uh, in June, the request was to change that location to the east side of the building. And the staff had some concerns at that time about the placement of that uh, car wash. There's a pinch point here, a very narrow area. And the last discussion we had with the plan, plan Commission had to do with the uh, access around the building and concerns from the fire department, potentially. Uh, we reached out to the fire department. They have no concerns uh, from their perspective to provide access to that building for life safety. So, uh, however, our staff still has concerns, and we are holding to our original recommendation of denial. We have concerns about circulation in this area. Um, this is a perspective here. There's a very narrow area here to get through with two-way traffic. There was discussion about maybe one-way traffic, but again, staff feels that that's concerning about, or confusing, I guess, to people uh, traveling behind that building uh, or in that particular area. So our recommendation is uh, denial of the request. Thank you. Any discussion among staff? Thank you, Paul. I make a motion to open the floor. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second to open the floor. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Does anybody wish to speak on this item? 
Yeah. I'm Dave O'Brien, 3323 Bay Ridge Court. Um, with uh, staff recommending that's a pinpoint owner, um, one lane of traffic in your zoning code. Once I have it written on. Requires only 14 feet for one way traffic, which uh, Kurt Mollinger, the developer, would prefer to see because all the traffic, some once in a while, comes off the roundabout and tries to break that behind the building to get to the other street on the other side. And he wants to try to eliminate that problem. And um, even for two ways of traffic, it's 22 feet. And that building, when it's placed on that building, will be five feet shorter than the existing building footprint. So instead of the picture that you've seen, Mason will be five feet to the, I guess you call it to the north. And uh, I just don't see the problem with that. It, it meets your zoning code for one way of traffic. Now, that's an opinion that it's a pinch point. It's not a, it's not a fact because your code states you only need 14 feet. And in theory, from the raised curb island of the uh, pay station to the edge of the existing asphalt is roughly 30 feet. So if nobody's there, you can bypass both ways if you want to. There's some in there. One of my plans shows that you can get out, but only go on one way, which would be to the south. I'll call it the south. And then, um, like I said, at the previous meeting, there would be a sign placed mm -hmm. on the side of that car wash or painted on the ground, one-way traffic only, mm -hmm. and similar to the portion in the back where the stacking would occur for that car wash. And the building facade itself would stay just as it sits right now. Thank you. So is what you're saying, just to be very clear here, that this change would actually reduce the size of the building and create five more feet of space? In the back, correct. Yep. And right in the in the back area where the, the same spot that the staff was concerned that was currently a yeah. point. The edge of the building is probably right here. Uh -huh. So there would be an additional five feet back there. Of space? Yep. Okay. Yep. Wisconsin law, um, you really, you have to look at what the CUP is for, not what a, a preference, personal preference, um, the building codes, the zones, those are two different things. So we're here asking for the CUP that we had approved on the one side of the building to be moved to the other side of the building. Some of the concerns were the neighborhood. Uh, when we take a measure point from the other side of the building to the closest house, it's approximately 130 feet to the house. On this side to this house that's right here, it is about 128 feet, a couple feet different. I've tried <coughs> to uh, meet with, this, with the city. I met with the ultimate here, um, showed him some different things, because if you remember, I'm the guy that also wants to buy the land up on the roundabout mm -hmm. that the city planning feels is the gateway of the city. I own both properties on both sides of it. Uh, I've had these people, that that house right there and the house next to it, were here last time. Yes. Under the Act 67, you can't listen to the consumer, if you will, uh, not consumer, the, the uh, people in the area 
unless they can drastically show some kind of negativity. Same, same flip of the coin. Act 67 says you have to actually look at not personal preferences, but is it someone that's trying to meet the codes, trying to do everything in their power to do what is necessary to comply? I've met with the alderman. I've got an email here from Wendy reaching back out to me. Uh, it was dated the 21st of June. I replied on Monday the 25th asking what her availability is that week to schedule a sit-down meeting. No response. Friday the 29th, Dave reached out to her asking what her availability is for the following week. No response. If I could actually sit down with these people, they might understand what we're trying to do is a little bit different than the normal car wash. The COP that we had approved is a COP with two conditions. One would be the time frame, and one would be that the facade of the building would remain the same. We are also looking to do a car wash that's different than what your typical car wash is. We are looking to do a car wash that has two sections of bays, so you have a wash bay and you have a dry bay. In the dry bay, both doors can be shut while it's drying the vehicle. So that would also eliminate some of the noise concerns, and that's why they put time restraints on it. But I can't even sit down with people because no one, is, they've got their opinions. We came back that fire is not an issue. It's now just a point of building code. Building code does not, is not supposed to hamper under this act the conditional use. I've been approved for it on the other side. There's nothing that stands out that makes it a significant impact than what was already approved. So I ask that you guys look at the business that I have there. This is supposed to be a built project, a gateway to the, to the city. Don't you want my business to prosper? Don't you want to see more things there? Why wouldn't you guys let me buy that other property, do more things there, enhance the city like you guys are pushing for? So all I'm asking for is a fair shake. Follow, not preferences, but follow what is right. That's all I'm asking for. One of the things that is of continuing concern to me is although there are neighbors currently who say that they are entirely in accord with your plan for the south <laughs> east side, um, there will be future neighbors there, and I'm still concerned with how close the car wash is to that southeast group of neighbors. You say that there's no more distance between the car wash and the closest neighbors there than there would be at the previously uh, northwest side location. Could you put up the site plan again? Because looking at it, I'm, I'm having a lot of trouble no. Understanding this. Yeah, so this is is the garage for that house. Uh -huh. So this is where the car wash was previously approved. So if you go up from here to the edge of that home, not the garage, but the edge of the house itself, that was about 130 feet. And when I took it, I think I took it from right about here to the edge of that right there, not the garage, that was about 129. Of course, it's going to be close to the garage, but you're not living in the garage. You're not sleeping in the garage. Understood. I was actually comparing more. If you're going over here, I don't have that. Concern. No, yeah, and I'm looking at the houses on the other side of, of Gray. Tell them okay. No, no oh, right. way That's up further. there. And thinking about how far the northwest side car wash location was from that group of houses, because there are a whole bunch of them, they're quite a bit further from that northwest location than these houses on the southeast are from the southeast location. Um, well, and remember, I, we're not just dealing with one house here, we're dealing with the neighborhood. But I'm also proposing something that's different, that's not out there. I'm proposing a longer car wash that has a wash bay system. Mm -hmm. Two and different bays. It, and it's from one room to the next room, and there's three doors in there. And so when the dryers, the actual dryer, you sit in place, and the dryer moves over, back and forth. Mm -hmm. Both doors shut. So the concerns are typically going to be noise, right? I think that would be everyone's noise concern. Noise traffic. I mean, you still have the line of traffic going in. Okay. And, and so as far as noise goes, we can, we can overcome that. As far as traffic, 
Um, the city of Green Bay owns this pro property right here. And they would, in the beginning, they would take this snow and drop it down in here. They stopped doing it only because I had to put uh, a bump here, I had to put a bump here, I had to put a bump here, because cars would come off that roundabout, fly to Gray Street. And we literally had people walking out our back doors of the businesses almost getting packed off. Yeah. So truthfully, I don't really want to have too many traffic for that. If we can eliminate that, I have no problems with that. And I must say, I really do appreciate your proposal of the one-way traffic through there. I think that was a, a very <coughs> smart idea, and I do want to recognize that. Is there anybody else that wants to speak on this? Ready? Sure. Um, I'm I, sorry I'm late. I had a well, committee meeting, so I'm, I didn't. I, I've been trying to reach out to the staff too to find out all the objections because I'm not sure I quite understand. I mean, if 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 this was a clean lot and someone came forward with a proposal for a strip mall that included a restaurant, beauty salon. Uh, gas station, mini mart, uh, liquor store, and a, and a uh, car wash. Would we really say all the rest is good, but not the car wash? I mean, it seems to me that the car wash adds value. It's going to help the the owner, which is good. Certainly, we we got the whole thing to prosper. And and I'm not sure how it's detrimental to the neighborhood. I mean, if it, if it was a, a new proposal with all those things together, I don't know that we'd say the car wash isn't a good idea. So to add it on now, I'm not sure why a car wash is a bad idea. That's what I want to hear. Why is a car wash a bad idea? I think noise is a factor, but I think when we limited the hours and we've got this new design, that takes care of that. Uh, concern about the fire lane, well, at least uh, the fire took care of that. That's not an issue. And then as far as traffic, uh, directionally, I think that this actually makes it better. And as far as the amount of traffic, well, it's a business. You're going to get traffic, you know. I, I think it's got it's going to be during business hours. So I don't know if the amount of traffic is really a concern either. So I'd really like to hear some really, you know, reasons why this is a bad idea. To me, it. It just seems it's adding value. There is no car wash on the whole north east to northwest side here. Um, yes, we want to. I, I could see when and when staff wanted this area here cleared for other development because he wanted to put the car wash here. That I can understand that argument. That argument makes sense. But I, I just don't understand why that's uh, an issue. I, I haven't heard a reason yet that really makes sense to me of why uh, that's a problem. It seems like all the things that could have been problems have been addressed. So, um, anytime we can help a business be better, thrive, I think that's something we should do. Uh, certainly, we want to take concerns of the neighborhood, but I think I think this establishment altogether, from the restaurant, the beauty salon, the gas station, uh, mini mart, alcohol, and the car wash, I think it all has value that uh, the neighbors can appreciate. Um, Calls I've gotten, there were a few against, more were four. So, um, I kind of support it, unless I, unless I can hear from staff a real good reason not to. And I, I haven't heard that yet. Thank you. Yes, out of my story. Uh, thank you, Chair. I was just wondering, was there a traffic study done in this area? You know, I mean, a you know, for this project, any, any kind of traffic study? No. no. Okay. I think, I mean, I think, and I'm looking at the map here. I drew maps for a living, but I'm just looking more than more. <laughs> just the way you've got it. You got... Street. That's Atkinson Street going to the tower. Okay, street. so that, okay, that is Atkinson. Okay, so you're, mm -hmm. you're south, correct? Was the old grocery store? The old grocery store. Yep, yep. Correct. Okay. 
Because I think one of the concerns was uh, maybe some of the traffic or some of the residential area to the south if they'd be affected. And the fact that you're talking about a one-way street. It's an existing complex, just looking at that kind of watch. Anybody else wish to speak? Anybody else? Okay, hearing none, I'll close the floor. Any further discussion among yes, Alderman, or er, Commissioner Lefisky? <laughs> Sorry. He can call me Alderman. They tell me <laughs> I would really lose that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was high hard. They actually, actually called me the mayor of the East Side yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, among other uh, <laughs> I agree with the alderman here. I mean, man, why am I I'm sitting here thinking too? Uh, why are we picking on this guy? Are we back to the same old thing? We don't want to improve things. No, we don't want new things. Uh, we don't want to increase the taxes uh, and, and make it more comfortable for the business operator to come to Green Bay and improve his business. Uh, wow, I, I see nothing wrong with it, and uh, I, I think that. Uh, He's addressed the issues at hand. Uh, man, he's changed the hours for running at the car wash. I, I think that's a that's a big uh, big thing for somebody to really try. The guy is almost bleeding his heart out trying to increase, improve his business, improve the taxation of the property, and help the city of Green Bay grow in the right direction. And, uh, without any further ado, I would make a motion to approve it. Can I have suggest two things possibly? Yes. If you do consider approving it, there should be some conditions that go on with it. As previously approved on the west side. So you may want to consider that avenue as well. And maybe to better explain the circumstance here again, maybe I didn't make myself clear, is the confusion for the motorists. It's not a traffic, it's not a volume issue. It's simply people maybe considering going around the building for a shortcut or going a different direction. Their travel lane is the drive through for the car wash. So there is, you can have one-way traffic, I suppose, if you could physically constrain them, but cars coming this way trying to get around the building are going to be stuck here. They're going to try and go around this queue lane here and possibly find another car or another object or something else that's going to be in their way where they just can't get around the building. The, the building is tight to begin with. It's, it's simply, the only issue staff have is to travel lane and the confusion it's going to cause for motorists wanting to go around the building. If they do, it's just confusing. So that's our simple point about that. If you're going to consider conditions, I would revisit those conditions from uh, the May meeting that, that included the west side uh, car wash portion. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Oh. Do we know what those conditions are that we should add those to the motion? Or is that the hours and stuff again? Is that the hours, the hours the facade of was part of that, like no, the transparency in the facade. Okay. Uh, one way street takes care of one of your biggest issues you just brought up, but where are where are, why aren't these conditions in here already? Because we didn't recommend approval of the request. You can have one way direction, but again you need to have a, a safety lane to get out of that traffic as well. Mm -hmm. So in essence you're creating two one ways out, but again, it still creates confusion for the motorists who might be heading back towards Gray Avenue. So, again, it's a very tight area that's back there. Moving the building or backing off that space is good, but you can see that there's a short bus, uh, a shuttle bus there that's, that's parked there. I don't know how you're going to get around that, that parked vehicle. It's probably just going to need a cup of coffee with it. Let's take it. Right, but, but as a motorist who doesn't know that and you're trying to get around the building or get it out of, off the property, you're going to be stuck in a position where you might have a car coming directly towards you. You can sign it, you can physically limit it, but it's going to be challenging for the motorist who just thinks, I want to just get around the building. That issue didn't really present itself on the west side. It was a different circumstance. It was a greater distance, greater separation. We're still looking for a second on that yeah, motion. Yeah, could you have a comment other than the second? Yeah, but I think we need to have a second so we know we have the motion so on we the floor. Discussion. <laughs> okay. Is there a second to this motion? And the motion dies for lack of a second. Yeah. Is there any further discussion? 
Yes, Commissioner Berman. I do want to pick up the issue that Commissioner, uh, that Alder Person Scannell met, raised. Um, number one, we're not talking about whether there should be a car wash or not. We already approved having a car wash, car wash. but it was a car wash at a different location. So the issue is the location. Uh, and quite honestly, I appreciate very much your double bays and the uh, advantage that that's going to create. Uh, but I'm still hearing in the back of my mind uh, the lengthy conversation about the location of the Quick Trip Car Wash uh, next to Festival Foods on University Avenue, where two homes were raised in order to get them out of the near space to that car wash. And uh, clearly the concern was not noise alone, it was noise plus lights plus traffic. And although you've managed the, the noise part of it nicely, the, the lights and the traffic are still a part of the deal. Um, and the need for people to go around the back here, despite your, your one ways, I, I do think Paul raises a good issue about the confusion coming into, into the location. I also want to note, however, that uh, I wish that you and the city had been able to work out the purchase of the property you originally wanted, um, or some way of, of uh, making that a possibility for you. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Thank you. I'm not, however, ready to make a motion to deny. Good. So if somebody is. Okay. Is there any further discussion? I have a question for yes. staff. Commissioner Kotowski. As far as the restrictions we can place, or the conditions we can place on, on this uh, CUP, can we require um, that the landowner, in order to get the CUP, create one-way traffic and, cr and install signage? Or is that too restrictive? No, I, th I think we <laughs> could do that, but I don't know logistically if that still solves the issue of circulation. We'll tempt you on that building, but sure you could you could do that, yes. Thank you. If, if that is done and an issue still occurs, then the onus would be on the property owner. Would yeah. not? Well right, sure. Mm -hmm. But this responsibility I guess of the city, the staff, that's why we have off street parking requirements to help avoid some of those potential situations. Right. Yeah. Will something happen? Maybe, maybe not. If it's difficult, it just doesn't seem like a, an appropriate situation. Commissioner Ruspeski. Uh, would it be appropriate that we would uh, vote on or make up these conditions and include it in my motion? Was that sweetened up the pot? I, I'm looking at something that's almost harassment to this person oh, who's actually on. trying to see it. That's my and, opinion. And, and, yeah. You can try. I'd like to see him move on and, and do, you know, do the things he's trying to do. and. Uh, Sounds like he's just, man, why? Every yeah, time they, they, he's talking, that he can't get anybody even talking. Outside of it. I don't know why. But. Perhaps Commissioner Wisbisky would prefer to provide some response to the concerns that have been raised by the other members of the commission. We are not harassing this gentleman. We're okay. trying to sort our way through some things that raise some issues for us. Well, I believe that we have already come up with some conclusions on how to improve it. Uh, signage, one-way street, hours regulated. Uh, I'm very sorry, I guess I'm a little bit more passionate because I have, have been an alderman and I, I actually recognize the alderman for his opinion. And uh, I don't know if he's found out, have you, have you learned anything yet? Uh, <laughs> it seems like we're just going back and forth here, you know. I learned some every day. Good for you. But, yes, I think there's a path with getting conditions in there. What I think might be a little bit troublesome is trying to get the conditions that match up with what we're trying to do. Putting a, a sign up that says one way doesn't necessarily stop somebody from entering that way. Right. What could be done to make it almost not impossible because there's no way, of course. How are we going to be able to dictate that? Is it, what kind of traffic calming measures would we have to go through to really get to that point is where I think we're going to have a little bit of trouble. Oh. Saying maybe a sign is probably not going to be a 
enough. So we're going to have to be very specific with the conditions if we do want to go that way. I was thinking perhaps is there some way to make some physical features, some potted trees or posts or something that would help curve it? Well, I just wonder if fire, if at that point, because you're stopping traffic from being able to go around, then, the if then it's a, a fire yeah, hazard of some sort. Because I was thinking pylons or something, if the traffic's not supposed to go through there, just put pylons up. But well, yeah. I wasn't so much thinking there as if we went back to the, the front end, because it seemed like it was concerned about traffic. Coming, off the road. coming this way so if we had some things out here to direct traffic this way and to make it clear that this way is not a way to be going so it wouldn't be over here it'd be over here which is more open I don't think that would necessarily block but you have signage and some physical barriers that would attract the eye as well as kind of give it you see those semi trucks there. I don't know if the semi trucks need to be able to get around the building too. Right. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Semi trucks don't go around the building. We, we take all orders from the front. Okay. Okay. And I don't think we can. It wouldn't be so far up here, but it'd be kind of more down here. I don't know. I don't know. That would be. Yeah, I don't know. Those are all building folks, so we right. can get through that. Yes, commissioner. I was keeping. I want to get to a place where I can approve this for this business owner, and I'm trying to think this out. You know, people, especially in driving, are creatures of habit. If we can create some, I guess, standardized lane demarcation um, beyond just the the, the um, one-way entrance signs, you know, people tend to follow lane demarcations. So if we could somehow create some painted, you know, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word, traditional lane demarcations entering from that roundabout, mm -hmm. um, even though it's not technically a thoroughfare, and it's not actually a thoroughfare either, if traffic is utilizing it as a thoroughfare, why not get a little creative here and create some lane demarcation coming off the roundabout so people who are driving off it can see, okay, well, the lane demarcation goes this way, so I must go this way. You know, that's any driver understands how a lane demarcation works. Mm -hmm. So if the property owner is willing to accommodate that type of condition where it's not a particularly high expense, in my opinion, to create some lane de demarcations on the road or on the driveway, leaving the roadway, I think the traffic 99% of the time is going to follow the lane demarcation because that's what we're trained to do as drivers. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? Uh, it's like my own personal people. position is yes, you would think they would do that, <laughs> but yeah. people don't always do it, even common sense would dictate. Sure, I, I, I just don't think we can get to a perfect solution, yeah. but if we can get to a really good one that's going to deter the vast, or guide, not deter, but guide the vast majority of drivers into the way they're going to go. I mean, I work on a one way street on Jefferson. That doesn't mean people aren't driving the wrong way down that street all the time. We can't make it perfect, but if we can make it good, I think that that's a good solution. With signage that might point yes. toward car wash that way, which is the opposite of what you would otherwise expect. Thank you for coming in. Yeah, that's a good point. Commissioner no. I guess what I'm getting uncomfortable with now is none of us are traffic engineers, much less architects. Absolutely. And I, I don't want to be putting conditions in that I have no training to do sure. in that regard. So um, possible, th what's coming to me possibly is, is there some verbiage, some wordage that we can put in there in the condition that says it has to be, hits a certain threshold of signage or something that is that we can do without necessarily doing what somebody that's more qualified than us should be doing. We could add it, we could have the conditions first of all that Paul had on the previous um, okay for this, adding on the requirement of the one way to which our owner has already agreed and um, a, a traffic plan that is deemed suitable by the planning department and the traffic department. There you've got your expertise. Doable? 
I think there should be two lanes of travel, of course. One going to the car wash and then one that would go around that Q lane as well. So I think you're going to have two lanes of traffic. And you're, just, you're dictating that that be one-way traffic, is my understanding, just to be clear. Because I think I think you still need to have vehicles to be able to pass around those in the queue. Are there going to be many in the queue? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. Maybe my one or two at most. Yeah. My major concern would be the, the issue that, that um, I lost it, Jake raised, um, that we need to have experts looking at this and figuring out what's necessary. The fire department has okayed this, and I appreciate that, and I'm glad we tabled it so we know that information. Uh, but I am still concerned about, as you suggested, uh, having people guided in the right direction. And I'm not sure you want to guide them back to there. That is, to the corner of the car wash. I think you want them going around the whole darn building right. and coming at the car wash from the back. Mm -hmm. And that suggests a one-way circulation yep. that is uh, counterclockwise. But I don't know that because I'm not expert. <coughs> So, Jerry, you want to add in um, no, I, I believe a that, circulation uh, pattern? I believe that if uh, our uh, traffic engineer was sitting here, he'd probably have the answer right away. And I, I agree with uh, the fact that we are not here to make decisions on traffic flow and patterns. Uh, but uh, and I think that we do have the experts that can come up with an answer right away. I, I honestly do. I think that, uh, even our director of DPW probably won't protect you guys and just do it like this. You know? So, well, uh, just a point of clarification on the public right of way, the traffic engineer is involved. He also does review on site issues, but this is a zoning requirement, not a building code issue. This is a zoning requirement, and you can dictate the travel motion. And I think, again, that's, if that's what you're after, you can certainly do that. Staff can work with the traffic engineer to get guidance from his professional perspective. I would think that the owner would be very compatible with uh, working it out with him also to, you don't have to dictate it, I think he's going to accept it just to move ahead, hopefully. Probably avoid some possible accidents that way, you can't get that kind of stuff. So Jerry, would you build that into your motion? Yes, I would. With approval by the um, approval of a circulation pattern? Uh, and proper uh, signage or whatever. I've, se I've seen it where they, they get it so rash that they actually put spikes up in a different direction. Mm -hmm. I don't, I never did, I never did like the fact that they're coming off that roundabout and coming in there. I mean, what the heck is that? That seems like it. <laughs> really weird. So we have a motion with the condition that yes. we just yeah. And just so I'm clear, pending approval from State zoning administrator and traffic engineer. Yeah. Is staff comfortable with that as well? Is that the verge? I think it says trying to design on the fly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'd second the motion. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I ask that you cast your vote. Aye. And that did include the previous conditions? Yes. yes. possible action on the request to authorize a conditional use permit for a two-family home in a low-density residential district at 891 Howard Street, submitted by Adam Thank you. Uh, this is a request to have a two-family home in a R1 zoning district. So as you guys are familiar, to have a two-family home, you have to have a conditional use permit. 
Uh, this property was previously used as a three-family home under the grandfathering. It had lost occupancy for over 12 months, and now there's a new owner who is going to take this unit from a three-family to a two-family, still requiring the conditional use permit. So with that, the comprehensive plan is pretty much a C in yellow, indicates low-density residential, and the zoning is all R1, which is the single-family residential. This is a Google Street view of the property itself. So this is the driveway. They did um, get approval to build a garage in the back here, so there will be a garage in the rear. Uh, the lot is pretty small. They did go to the Board of Appeals to have the impervious space reduced. Um, so that has already been approved and taken care of. So this is the site plan that they've provided. So the home up here, again, this used to have the three units. This will be converted to a two unit. The drive is being redone. They'll have two parking stalls in front of the garage, one for each unit, and then an interior lot for each of them. Uh, with this, we do a neighborhood analysis of 300 feet. So everything is kind of hard to see that's outlined in the orange here. These parcels are all two-family homes. Everything that's got the yellow marking over it is a multifamily. Usually those are three or four in this neighborhood. And this is the subject property that we're discussing. So with the neighborhood analysis, it's uh, about 26% of the neighborhood is already a two or a multifamily, which is teetering on a request that we're going to look at. So we are recommending approval of this simply because it's always been used as either a two or a three family home. Um, and the new property owners have done our rec our going forward with a substantial amount of work to this property. So previously, it kind of been a little bit of a nuisance property. There's always orders against it. The new property owner is putting in a lot of work for this property. So we think that this will be a benefit to the neighborhood, and it does fit in pretty well, considering that immediately next to it, there's some multifamily, but there isn't much two-family that's very close to it. So with that, we do have the standard conditions that they have to follow the rest of the municipal code and the UBC. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. And in front of you, there's an email that came in after our staff report. Um, uh, somebody within the 200 foot notice area who is opposed to the request. Citing some of the things that they are fixing through the renovation process. Thank you. Stephanie, I'm just following up on your last comment there. Have all of these issues been addressed that are in the email? Pretty much. There are some things that we don't really deal with, like if people are parking in the wrong spot, usually our inspection officials would have something to do with that. Some of these things are just between property owners, like mm -hmm. pets going the wrong places, we can't really do that. Yeah. But the parking, the green space, all of those have already been taken care of either through the Board of Appeals or the pro this process or through the site plan review that they're doing for the two-family home. And how about the concern about adding to the de density of the multiple? That's family. what this analysis is supposed to take right. care of. So it's already been used as that, so it isn't technically adding anything. Um, I could see that while it was vacant, obviously you have less people in the neighborhood, but this isn't adding three more families, it's only adding two, two. more. Right. Um, so we usually just try to do kind of a percentage-based analysis, and usually 30% is a pretty good <coughs> mix for a neighborhood, so this is on, just under that at 26. Discussion amongst them. Can we find out if anybody wishes to speak to this from the floor? No. I move to open the floor. Okay, we have a motion to open the floor. Do we have a second? Second. Do we have a motion and a second to open the floor? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Do you want me to walk yes, up there? Yes, if you would. And state your name and address, please. My name is Michelle Salsider. I live at 908 Howard Street, but I've lived there for about 25 years. I grew up in this neighborhood, and I oppose this because we have been revitalizing our neighborhood with the Seymour Park Neighborhood Association. Um, you can say that it's going, yes, from a three-family down to a two-family, but when you have a two-family where one's in the front and one's in the back, the one in the front technically uses the front yard as a playground and it looks terrible. The, the person may be having great intentions of fixing it up and doing a great job and everything, then they turn around and they sell it. And so then you have somebody else that owns it and they don't care about who they are renting to. I live in this neighborhood, I'm invested in this neighborhood, I will be living in this neighborhood until I die. And I really don't think that having this, and I don't really think the percentages really matter. Think about how you are living across from a house like this. 
and you're sitting on your front porch and you're watching and you're seeing cars that make a lot of noise and toys and junk all over the front yard and in and out renters and whatever have you, you know, and I've had my issues with a lot of different owners owning the gray one, the really big one next door, and actually went and talked to that person and said, you know, I live across the street. Would you like to look at your house? The person who is fixing this, would they live across the street and want to look at this house? No. You wouldn't want that. You wouldn't want that in your neighborhood. We are trying to, the reason you rezone this where it's a single family is so you can get them to be more single families, so you can get more people that want to invest in this neighborhood. Nobody is going to invest in a neighborhood that has a lot of rentals. And I have fought other ones and succeeded to get them to be two families. They've been illegal three families in the neighborhood, so people are already sliding under this, so our percentages is up without your knowledge. So I, I've raised my kids in this neighborhood. It's a great family neighborhood. We just have to promote it as a great family neighborhood. And it's not when you have rentals. It just is a problem. And when you change the zoning, I wish you would keep that when it changes to a single family, that it doesn't get the conditional use. So that's how I feel. Thank you. Yes, sir. Can I speak? I'm Adam Doyan. I'm the new owner of the property. <coughs> I own 11 rental properties. Um, my basic goal is to pave the whole driveway, build a garage, clean up everything. New windows, new doors. I mean, it sat vacant for a year. It looks pretty crappy. Um, <coughs> the biggest concern I got is the two houses, there's no way to transfer between them. Front one's got five bedrooms, two bathrooms. Back one's got two bedrooms, one bathroom. There's a big firewall, like one was built in a certain age and then the other one was built afterwards. There's no way to make it one family. It's almost impossible. Unless we bulldoze one part of it. <coughs> so I'm invested into this neighborhood also, and a lot of money into it. Um, this whole back is all gravel. I'm gonna plant all grass there, putting up a fence. Um, make it all nice. I had an uncle on one, two blocks down. And I've been there since I was a kid, and that's the reason I bought it in this neighborhood, and I do want to clean it up. That's the reason I bought it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Josh Kufal, uh, 900 Howard. We have lived, lived, my wife and I have lived there for five years. I've lived in the neighborhood for about 12. I can tell you these multifamily houses are where all the problems end up coming from. Uh, th this house currently has been a disaster for the five years we've lived there. There's a two bedroom right here that also constantly, or a two family, or I think it might even be a three right now, constant every six, nine months, landlords kicking them out. I mean, it's a constant problem. People are running from, from this house to this house when it was around to that house. I think the multifamilies in that area just end up being a lot more trouble, and it's partially because of that neighborhood. And it's, it's as Michelle had said earlier, there's a lot of good things that have been happening in there. I think if we continue to look at multifamilies in there, I think we're just, we're, we're taking down people like me who want to invest in that neighborhood in single families. I don't want to be listening to loud cars every day. I don't want to junk out on the street. And I understand he's, got a plan to fix it and everything else, but we've seen that with the one next to us, we've seen that with the one across. They fix it up, six months later, it's demolished, and they're back to square one. That's kind of what happens in that area, and uh, with that being said, I would very much not like the, the two families in there. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak? Hearing none, we will close the floor. Any discussion amongst them? I will state that um, if this were a single family, 
and they wanted to convert it to a two-family, I would probably be opposed to it mm -hmm. for the reasons that have been stated. But this has historically been a two-family. It's always been a two-family mm -hmm. or a three-family. It was built as such, and that's what it has always been. Um, and the fact that there are other multifamilies in the neighborhood, you know, for better or for worse, that's the way it is. Uh, so it is my inclination to support this request. Excuse um, me, but it's being sold as a one-family online? No. It's I mean, we're close, close, but it's, it's a two-family and it's being requested to be continued as a two-family. Um, so I would be inclined to support this request. Commissioner Governor. <coughs> I think I will also be voting in favor of the request, but I want to note two things. First of all, we are in an economic situation where more and more people need rentals. We do not have very much affordable housing. Uh, and I want to confirm that it is the case that we hear here at the Planning Commission over and over that people who are in neighborhoods with a lot of rentals have a lot of trouble with the folks who are in those rental properties. Your proper recourse is, number one, your courage in addressing somebody directly and reminding them that you are a neighbor uh, and that you have to look at their house. The other one is to call the, uh, the city and s submit a complaint because that is the way the operations work as far as uh, controlling misuse of property. So with that in mind, I do think that uh, moving from three to two is an improvement, and I appreciate the work that's already been done by the owner here. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay. Okay. Yes, Commissioner Miller. Uh, just bouncing off what, what Sid said, um, it is unfortunate the neighborhood has had some issues and uh, there are ways to handle that, uh, but we, we cannot hold back the property owner from improving the property and really put, getting, getting into a better situation than it was before. Hopefully the renters that are in there next time are going to be better neighbors to you, um, but th there's nothing that can really hold them back from doing that, so I will also support. One other, if I might add. Yes. Uh, we're talking about a landlord who lives in the area as well and who has made a commitment to that area. And I uh, have a sense that he will be looking for good tenants. I certainly hope that's the case. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Hanson. Um, I don't want to discount the neighbor's feelings toward this. Um, I live actually a pretty quick job away from here over on Allard um, and so I pass, I drive down all the time and I pass this area and I know that Howard um, is really, I feel like on the upswing. Um, as a landlord myself who owns properties that were single family that had been converted before we owned it, I don't go in and try to fix it with the idea that someone, I'm going to rent to people who are going to trash it immediately. So, you know, like Commissioner Bremer was saying, you know, if you have issues with the neighbors, contact the city, see if it's something that they're out of compliance with. Um, because no one wants to have, you know, bad neighbors. But at the same time, we are short on rental properties in the city, and we are short on apartments. So um, I would support the approval of this as well. Thank you. Commissioner Rosbisky. Uh, this comes from an ex landlord. It's the very reason why I got out of it. Got rid of all the homes, basically. And uh, I think the good side of this thing is, is that it's a three family and we're going to two family. Normally, it's been the history of this planning commission to get back to a one family as soon as we can and clean it up. Uh, as far as uh, people not take care of the properties and things like that. There is a system set up with the city where uh, you can report them. I would encourage anybody that has any problems with properties that are not being kept clean, torn up, whatever. Uh, one of your first approaches might be right through your alderman and you have an excellent alderman who has just gotten elected to that district who uh, call them. Tell him what's going on. And, uh, he'll uh, 
I almost promise you that guy's going to respond and he's going to get that straightened out. Well, we've had some problems in the last 30 years there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, but uh, when I was an alderman, basically, I had areas, believe it or not, on the east side. They were just as bad as this, not worse. And, uh, it, it, I had to get after them. And, uh, sometimes you, you know, go knock on the door yourself and say, oh, and say, hey, you know, this isn't going to apply. But you do have the city behind you, and you have legal people behind you to not put up with that type of condition. So uh, start with your alderman men and uh, try that. And, uh, I'm sure that uh, you can make amends. As far as changing the whole neighborhood to single family, I think that's an insurmountable uh, uh, chore to ever switch that completely over to single families. But, uh, Nice to do it if you could, but uh, I think you just try to clean up what you have there, basically, and make it more pleasant. And, and I think you're, you're going to get more top grade people in there, probably, and uh, hopefully uh, this gentleman who plans on doing what he's saying, uh, I believe he's going to do it. And uh, I think he's heading in the right direction. The very fact that he lives there, he must have, man, a lot of he must have. Been pretty well fed up with everything. So, so he smart. He started buying these houses, but I seen a lot get condemned. And boom. more power to you for being a landlord, man. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. I'd move to approve the proposal for all the reasons that uh, my, my fellow commissioners have stated. I second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the recommendation. Any further discussion? Very none. Okay, hearing that, all those in favor, you can start with saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Recommendation passes. Okay. Item 4. Consideration with possible action on a request to consider an amendment to the previously approved conditional use permit for a shelter facility in an office residential district located at 1660 Christiana Street, submitted by Joel Erper, Macquarie Engineering and Surveying, on behalf of Holt of Hope Green Bay Corporation. Hey, Mr. Chair, this is a request to amend a previously approved conditional permit, conditional use permit from 2014. Uh, subject property at 1660 Christiana Street, and that's Subject property here, Shano Avenue, Perkins, uh, Christiana actually is here. The front of the building is on Christiana. Um, the request is to uh, expand the use, the shelter use there under the conditional use permit, and so they're coming back uh, for that review. They were able to acquire a few different parcels here, 1667 Shano, which is a single family home, and 1776 uh, Christiana, I believe, which is a former CBRF make kind of a campus size uh, area, it's about eight or a half in size, uh, so to speak. Um, the comprehensive plan recommends medium intensity retail office of housing in this area, so only this use is consistent with that. Um, back in 2014, we did two things. We did a rezoning to office residential to include several parcels in here, including the House of Hope property. We also did that initial conditional use permit at that time as well. Um, so this is the recent site plan of the area, Shano Avenue on the top, uh, Perkins, Christiana, the original shelter facility is right here. Uh, the single family home that they picked up is here, will now become a parking lot. Uh, the former CBRF, which they acquired, will now be connected with the building in between, in, uh, between those two structures. So again, this is an expansion, uh, they need to amend the conditional use permit, and uh, they've come forward to do so. Uh, we notified affected property owners. We haven't received any calls or questions regarding this. And uh, staff is recommending approval of the item subject to those conditions that are attached within the agenda. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Move to open the floor. Second. We have a motion and a second to open the floor. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Is there anybody that wants to speak on this item? I'm here from Mach 4. If you have any questions, I can answer them. But I don't have any other comments other than staffs. Thank you. Are there any questions for the representative? No? Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? Okay. 
Motion to close the board. Motion to close the board. Do we have a second? Second. second. Motion to approve. We have a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the recommendation. Any further discussion? Mary none. All those in favor of the request? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Recommendation passes. Thank you. Item 5. Consideration with possible action on a request to consider an amendment to the previously approved conditional use permit for a shelter facility in an office resi residential district located at 411 St. John Street to permit a temporary summer shelter use submitted by Alexia Wood and St. John Shelter. Hey, Mr. Chair, this is uh, another request to amend our previously approved conditional use permit. That's for St. John's uh, Homeless Shelter. Uh, this facility uh, has a current CUP. It runs on a three-year uh, cycle at this point. Uh, that approval will end on uh, November 1st of this year. This is an amendment to their operating plan, which or to their operation, which typically is a six-month window. It's from November 1 to April 30th. Uh, at that end of that April 30th time frame, uh, they found they had some additional gas and they had no place to go. So there were some attempts to work with other churches throughout the community and relocate some of these individuals and these guests to those facilities. Uh, that caught the attention of our fire marshal who was very concerned about the housing arrangements. Uh, these uh, churches had uh, uh, gym facilities, maybe classroom spaces. They were literally just to provide shelter. But it still provided an, an issue for our fire marshal and our staff. So we met with uh, the applicant and we talked through some of the issues. The shelter is vacant during the summer months. We felt this was the appropriate location. This is an approved facility uh, for up to 84 individuals, I believe. It's sprinkled. It's a facility that can handle um, a short-term use like this. So this is a limited basis, and our conditions are kind of reflected with that. Um, this is very similar to the original COTS program. Uh, this is a floor plan of the uh, part of the former school. They'd still be using the gymnasium portion of that building um, with limited facilities and basically just providing basic shelter for these months up until November 1. Um, we have notified affected property owners. We've received a few calls, but we haven't received any objections to this request. So, we are recommending approval of the items subject to these standards here. This is kind of an abbreviated list that you might have seen previously on the uh, original CUP approval. Um, but these are the conditions that we're recommending for approval. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Bremer. Paul, the recommendation um, refers to a limitation of 30 beds. Can yes. you say why the reason? What is the reason for that? I, th I think that kind of stems from the letter from the applicant and he talked about 27 individuals. We just gave them a little rounded number to, to work with. I, so based on the applicant's yes. request? Yes. Right. They indicated 27. We felt that was just an appropriate number. Thank you. Thank you. So are all these conditions um, also part of the winter months as well? The winter months is probably a little bit longer. This has just been okay. customized to the, the summer and fall months, basically. But it, it really kind of mirrors some of those conditions that we've seen, we've seen before. Are there any here that are new? The only thing that's new is probably the last one, and that was a request from uh, Fire Marshal. that they have building plans available. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there were any other changes that I can see in this room. Apart from the 30 bed maximum again. Correct. That, that changed the hours yep. of operation. Right. Sure. Is this the, the identical facility that has 84 bed capacity in the wintertime? Mm -hmm. It is, yes. The applicant is here. They can better speak to how they utilize the structure. But you can see the areas that are cross-hatched out, oh, those would not be utilized. It strictly be in the gym facility. And the fire marshal did ask it not be on the second floor of the structure. So it's limited just to the gym, <coughs> former gym. Is that consistent with the winter months, this, this uh, restrictions that you just mentioned? I believe they utilize that for other uses and other programming. Uh, you'd have to ask the, uh, the applicant regarding that, how it's fully used. Thank you. Any further discussion? Motion open the floor. Second. 
We have a motion and a second to open the floor. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Does anybody wish to speak on this? Yes, ma'am. All right, good evening. Um, my name is Alexia Wood. I'm the executive director for St. John the Evangelist Homeless Shelter as well as the MICA Center. And so you will be seeing us, as Paul mentioned here in a couple months, um, regarding our permit for the seasonal shelter, but tonight speaking specifically to COTS. So St. John started 13 years ago to meet the need um, of individuals that were left without shelter options in the harsh winter elements um, due to either long waiting lists or eligibility criteria. And so I've been with the organization now for six years. We've certainly seen growth um, both in our operations and, and as well as in need. Um, and in the letter that I had enclosed that Paul sent out with the packet, we speak to certainly the need that exists when our doors close April 30th. And so um, April 30th of 2017, we saw nearly 40 individuals who had no place to go when our shelter doors closed. The reality, certainly homelessness exists um, beyond the six months of operation that St. John's um, is able to meet that need November through April. This year, um, we looked to, we spent a, a year and a half intensively looking at addressing that summer need. Certainly, it's been a topic of conversation for 13 years. Um, but as you may know, we have lost four homeless individuals in a year's time um, to the streets to sometimes preventable causes. And so the two that had occurred in May of 2016 as well as May of 2017, individuals had sought refuge from the elements in places not meant for human habitation and then tragically passed away. And so. Um, our proposal for COTS, utilizing the church model, is simply to provide a safe place to sleep at night. All supportive services continue at the MICA Center at our year-round daytime resource center. Um, so in those conditions that were listed, one other change from um, the, the typical shelter season, the shelter, um, our hours of operation are 5 p.m. to 9 a.m. Here, we are simply looking to provide safe sleeping, just access to safety, um, in whether it's heat, um, rain, thunderstorms, extreme cold in, in May and October as well. And so um, looking to operate 9 p.m. to 6.30 a.m. They come in, they simply put down a mat, they wake up in the morning, they do their chores and they depart. And then again, meals, case management, um, showers, hygiene items, all of that are provided um, over at our MICA Center location. And so much of that information I outlined in the letter um, to Paul that I know again was sent out to you guys with the proposal to move it on site from the recommendation from the Green Bay Fire Department and the Green Bay Police Department um, is it provides a one one location access point um, for those two entities. So first, should um, the fire department respond to a need for a paramedic, they know exactly where to go, they're familiar with the facility, they know the facility is, has all the building and fire code um, things in place. And then for the police department, they are our primary referral source. Um, they find individuals living on the streets at night and with so many patrol officers, and they also, and I believe it's included in your packet as well, that the letter from Officer Van Handel, to have one location to know where to bring individuals when they're running across somebody on the streets in the middle of the night, and instead of spending hours of, of law enforcement time trying to find a resource and referral for those individuals. So what we are proposing here is simply to use um, the gym space, and then this is our women's harm reduction site in the, during the shelter season, um, and then extending down to the bathrooms. The spot that's marked off on the first floor um, that's that's kind of accounted for there, that is utilized during the shelter season. Those are our programming spaces, so our sobriety um, room, our employment area, our women's programming area. Um, but again, looking at simply providing access to safe overnight shelter in the summer months, just looking to limit, similar to what a fellowship hall or a gym would offer in a local parish. Um, just some stats on what we've seen so far with the church model here this summer. It's been in operation now for exactly 10 weeks, so 70 nights of shelter. We've served 144 different individuals since April 30th with 1,007 nights of shelter, so certainly a need. And yet our average length of stay is just under a week, and our average nightly guest is 14. And so this is not a long-term housing option. Um, this is not a housing program. This is emergency shelter until we can connect people with more appropriate resources and long-term supports. Um, and so the reality is these individuals need access to safe housing. We just heard about um, the, the lack of rental properties, lack of affordable housing for individuals living on a fixed income. We see that every year on April 30th. We also see it November 1st when our doors open. Um, sometimes, and I will speak to that bed capacity, we are, we are optimistic that our average nightly count um, has, has fallen between about 10 and 16 a night with that average nightly count of 14. We are somewhat concerned with what October could bring as the temperatures start to drop because we see that need November 1st. 
Um, but again, we've worked with the police department, we've worked with the fire department, um, we've met with, with the staff here at City Hall to come up with a plan that ensures that all of our homeless neighbors, um, homeless brothers and sisters have a safe place to go 12 months a year while also respecting um, the guidelines that were set forth in our original conditional use permit as well. So with that, um, I will open it up for questions. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, what, um, ignoring the, the, the number 30 for a moment, what, mm -hmm. what's your safe maximum capacity for cots under this design? Um, this design could comfortably, between the, the gym floor and then that, that woman's uh, facility right there as well, I would say comfortably 55 to 60 could be housed there. Under the billing code, it could go to 84. If there's a maximum capacity, Thank you. it could be done. So, and the building code, when we, um, that 84 would certainly account for, for the three additional programming spaces. Now, those um, have beds and living space and, and all of that. It's on an application process. So, so it's not that we consistently have um, a ratio of the census, but we're looking to move people into those programming spaces and then that kind of the ebbs and flows of the gym floor are dependent on that during the winter. Commissioner Brenna. So then to follow up, since you had 40 people who were homeless at the end of April. Correct. Why did you not request more than the 30 that's being recommended here, actually less than the 30? Well, and our letter did not request a number. Um, I believe Paul inferred from the fact that I referenced the individuals, um, and I have the exact number in here, that on April 30th of this year, 27 individuals did not have access to safe housing the following night. It was um, arbitrary. Um, but again, the reality is it's not that we're providing access to safe shelter for those 27 individuals for six months. The average length of stay is a week. Um, but we are seeing, and I shared in the letter, um, Green Bay Police Department had come across on the west side of Green Bay a 93-year-old man that was had been evicted and homeless, and simply um, due to to some memory concerns with his age, could not grasp that he was evicted, and it was somebody we had no prior history with. So we're receiving new referrals through police department. Those numbers could have been flow. Certainly we could see the need um, for that number to be higher than 30, I'd say May, October. Um, right now our nightly average is sitting at 14, and we're not, we're not trying to draw additional individuals in, um, but we're trying to meet the need of anybody that would otherwise be on the streets of Green Bay and whatever that need is. And that's the nightly average using the COTS Correct. rotating locations. Yes. Which I presume would make it more difficult for people to locate housing. At and times. We, well. we market the location in different mm -hmm. ways. Good. But I would say the church model, the rotating church model, um, which was also our attempt to um, include the wider Green Bay area in the conversation and not concentrated on the downtown Green Bay um, area. With that came some concerns with transportation. And so we saw the dip, for instance, we were at a church in Howard um, a couple weeks ago. Those numbers certainly decreased. It doesn't mean that the need um, decreased for that week, but simply the, the lack of access. That having it in one location, having it in a location that, that the homeless in this community are familiar with could drive those numbers up somewhat, and yet we are very um, cognizant of the fact that this is safe sleeping. And so for an individual to come in and, and have a mat on the floor and simply have um, sleeping arrangements from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. with the requirement to leave, um, we have not found people certainly looking to um, overstay their welcome, um, but they are grateful to have that option when they have no other options available. I'm presuming that you have some staff limitations too. I know you rely very heavily on volunteers and during summertime with vacations and all that's probably a lot harder to manage uh, in large numbers. Given, given what you can reasonably expect for staffing and what you think you might expect for uh, people in need, mm -hmm. what number would you put out there? So in this model, we do not, we do not rely on volunteers. Um, this is all, these are trained staff. These are year-round okay. staff that are very familiar with the needs um, related to mental health, chronic homelessness, trauma. Um, so they are all paid staff overnight. I would say, um, 
I, I would have a hard time picking a number because we have not offered um, this service before. What I can tell you is November 1st of last year, we had 42 people present for shelter. And within a few days, that number had, had risen um, quite significantly. And so certainly there is a need for individuals with significant mental health. There is not a desire to be in close community at times with others when they can be, when they feel safe living independently and in isolation. Um, and so we see thunderstorm driving numbers up. We see extreme heat. We see extreme cold temperatures. Um, if I had to guess what the numbers more realistically would look like those last two weeks of October, as the as the evening temperatures start to dip, I would guess that this number will more likely be in the mid to upper 40s. Um, and again, we're, we are doing all we can to attach individuals to services. And as I speak in that letter as well about our efforts to really decrease the number of homeless, the number of people seeking shelter, um, period, at any of the local shelters in town by attaching them to more permanent options. We are hopeful that that COTS accounts for individuals sooner that we can have them in housing options prior to November 1st. Mm -hmm. So. So my optimistic belief is we'll attach with them in July, August, September and have them attached to housing that they're, that they're not needing shelter in October or November. Based on temperatures and based on historic data, I would say perhaps upper 40s is what we'd see those last few nights of October. I'm asking the questions because I've been impressed by how well managed and how increasingly well managed over time the major shelter program, the winter shelter program has been. And I don't want to set you up for failure. Um, so, you know, one possibility is simply to increase those numbers up to something that's closer to what you think the demand might be within your capacity of staff. And uh, I think you said 50 something from the, uh, the fire department as far as what this part of the building could handle. And, and the fire department has no bearing. It would be us from an operation standpoint okay. when, I, when I threw up the number earlier. Yes. And the number was 50? I believe four? 55 to 60. Okay. Um, so that's one possibility. The other is simply to encourage you to let us know if you need to increase the numbers. But I'm inclined to do it ahead of time, Paul. Can you see any, see any reason not to? No, we can let the plan commission to. So. Okay. Because if we passed it for 30, they would have come back here if they wanted to increase it, correct? They yes. could, and we don't police it that closely, but yes, I mean, technically, yes. I would sure like their record to show that they had. Right. Yeah. Right. And our current model in the winter, um, as it's well known that we do not operate with capacity, we have the building capacity of 84, which we hold fast to. And yet when that number exceeds 84, we do not turn guests over 85 away um, because, again, as the shelter of last resort, we understand we'd be turning them out to the streets in some harsh winter elements. And so we have the overflow plan with local churches that the police department and fire department are aware of. Um, but given the fire department's recommendation to not utilize the churches as heavily that aren't up to fire code, um, for this model, it would, it would seem... It, it would be interesting for us to cap low and then have to use churches as overflow if the entire reason we're here tonight is to move out of the churches and into the main facility. Any other questions for me? For me? Okay. Yes, I'll <laughs> So with your staff, would you be comfortable at 55 if they, for this program? Yes, if the need presented um, and our numbers were at 55, we would staff accordingly um, and we would feel comfortable staffing for that. Is that it? That's it. Very easy for me. Okay, thank you. Yep, yep. Thank you. Would anybody else wish to speak? Yes, ma'am. I'd like to speak. Um, if you could go back to the mm -hmm. first picture you had with the property. I own all this property next to the buildings. I'm called continuously for robbery, vandalism, people sleeping in my bushes. It never ends. I think that you're offering them to come back down there. If they're too drunk to get into the building or whatever's wrong with them, they're sleeping on my property. The police have to come, take them, bring them over. I, I don't think any of it's a great idea because I don't think it's organized as well as any W shelter. 
but I know that that's a far reach from what they both are. But I feel that in the last 12 years, I've never been able to even rent my property. So it's a burden on me financially and trying to get people out of my bushes and I'm trying to help them find something. I don't think that it's more like a warming shelter. You're not progressively helping these people get to where they need to go because maybe they can't. But I think that doing this, talking about the historical downtown neighborhood, that's why I bought all the buildings, to preserve them, and I can't. So I'm out a half a million dollars. And it's a financial burden on me. So I recommend that maybe some of you drive around and go down there and go into the shelter and see what's going on there. And you'll be surprised. It's not what you think. Um, I have a guy living in the bushes right now you can't get rid of. He's got a really great setup, but I try to talk him into going. It, it's, it's something that downtown Green Bay doesn't need with this ref all this change downtown. I think that taking some of these, all they've taken all these buildings down now because no one will even rent them. If you notice, when you go down Monroe Street, a lot of buildings are gone now because you, you can't rent them because they're panhandling, they're drunk. It's ridiculous, but if they could get something to keep them coming to the right place or get it going correctly, I think maybe St. John's could have something going on, but I don't think they have the manpower and it's a very hard skill. But I don't feel, being a taxpayer, that I need to keep it going for myself. Um, because I can't even give the property away. I, I can't even get it rented for free. So, as a homeowner and trying to preserve the buildings, I'm kind of in a stalemate. So, I would like you to consider it because I've done this since 2005, asking for help to stop this, creating it to getting it bigger and bigger and bigger. I, I'm just afraid something terrible will happen down there if maybe things aren't done correctly and you keep it open through the summer. I don't know, but I'm not skilled in that area. But for the, the way it looks and what, how the whole around, it doesn't look great for downtown Green Bay. Uh, you know, my buildings, I try to do the best I can, keep them up, but it's hard to have people living in your bushes. And the police are there four times a week. So I'd like to consider that too. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Jim O'Neill. Uh, Ma'am, we don't know each other. It's nice to meet you. I Yeah, you're on the other side. Yes. I own the property right here, 403 mm -hmm. South Jefferson Street. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I bought the property when the homeless shelter was already established, so we knew what we were getting ourselves into. Mm -hmm. It is interesting to hear your perspective, and I respect your perspective, mm -hmm. but I will tell you, but for you making sorry. those statements. Could you address that? Oh, sure. I'm sorry. What, what I was going to tell the, the commissioners here is I've been impressed with what I've seen in the downtown area. Now, I don't live at that building, but I work there. You know, as Randall can attest, I spend most of my time downtown at that building. But in the sense of what I've seen are young families uh, pushing baby strollers and, and lots of activities. Now, again, the shelter is my neighbor, and I support the shelter. That's the other thing. I, I'm, I don't want to say I'm biased, but I've also taken the position that the shelter is there and it's not going away. So what I decided a couple of years ago was to start volunteering at the shelter. Right now I'm the chair of the board of trustees for the shelter, so we oversee uh, Lexi and the day-to-day -day operations. And so the COTS program and the summer program and getting all the volunteer ch uh, churches and all those things squared away, those are all things that was were, I can attest to you were well vetted by the board of trustees and by Lexi and the staff coming up with this plan. I can understand why the city came back and said, well, wait a minute, you guys, you got a shelter that's sitting vacant for the summer. Let's not move people around unnecessarily. Let's not create potential hazards and safety concerns. Let's utilize the, the shelter during the summer. So again, that's a proposal that we as a board of trustees have dealt with and, and now support what is now being presented. And I think from a number standpoint, where you're talking about the numbers from 30 to 50 plus, those kinds of things. 
Again, those are discretionary numbers and we would certainly appreciate that. But I will say this, the, the, the shelter is, it's a shelter of last resort. I'm not critical of comments of, against the shelter. I wish someday that we'd be here someday asking for a, a rezoning to make it into something else other than a shelter. But it's not going away. You've, in other uh, cases before this, this evening, the, the, the concept of, of low income housing, it is. It, it's in shortage in downtown Green Bay, it is. It, I, I, we've seen what, um, just within the last six months, um, oh, uh, this house went down, the house by uh, um, Newcomers Funeral Home went down, the house by Habish Davis went down. You know, and again, I get it, but that's just, I look at those houses now, my perspective has changed. I look at every house that's destroyed in downtown Green Bay and I'm thinking, there was another opportunity for low income housing. So again, that, that's not what we're dealing with today, but I would just this evening would say, first of all, as a, as a landowner there, um, yeah, there's issues with the shelter in the sense of because of the type of people that we're serving. But I can assure you that if we turn our backs on these, the, the problem doesn't go away. And the staff that I've seen at that shelter and the volunteers is, is amazing. It is amazing. So I would encourage all of you to visit the shelter, whether it's during the summer season or certainly selfishly I'll say from November through April when we, when we have volunteers. And it's a well, in, in my opinion, a well uh, organized and, and structured shelter that are dealing with people that hopefully none of us have the issues that they're dealing with. And so I would just say from, from uh, my perspective as a landowner downtown, I, I support this, this change and, and, and would welcome it. And also as a volunteer at the shelter, I would assure, assure you that all of us, from the Board of Trustees to all the volunteers, are committed to running that shelter in a manner that is respectful to people who are in desperate need. And, and so the volunteers and the shelter staff do the best they can. So I thank you for your, for your time and attention. Yes, sir. I'm Bob Arnold. I am not a citizen of the city of Green Bay. I live in Ashwaubenon, but I am on the board of trustees. I'm the treasurer for St. John the Evangelist Homeless Shelter. Um, and I volunteer there and I support that organization because I think of us as a community, we have an obligation to all of our citizens. And where some people might think of uh, St. John the Evangelist Homeless Shelter as a problem, we're actually a solution to a, a greater problem within the community. And so I support it, and I would encourage you to uh, grant the conditional use permit amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Harry none. I'll close the floor. Any further discussion? I believe uh, Alderman's going to. Oh, Alderman's going to. You don't need the floor for me, though. Well, technically we do. But after an alder, do you? Yeah. Well, anyways, uh, just want, you know, uh, this is in my district, and uh, I've been involved with St. John's and the Mighty Center for a long time, and I think Lexi does a fantastic job. It's a difficult job. I think, I think, unfortunately, I think the city has failed you. If we were having those problems, we need to do something as a city to help you. Uh, but as a community, we have failed people who are homeless. They are not getting the services they need. And that's not St. John's fault, that's all our fault. Um, they're doing the best they can with the clientele they have. But some of those people need greater resources than, than what are being provided. And until that happens, we're gonna have problems. And if St. John's went away, that problem would just be, they'd still be in bushes. They'd still be in your bushes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, no one should be living on our streets. And, and, and no one should have to sleep out, no matter what the weather. I mean, for a while, it was an emergency shelter and, and, and the cold was the main, because you could easily die from exposure. Uh, but as we've learned, you know, the heat and, and getting away from thunderstorm, you know, it's, no one should have to live in those conditions. So uh, I fully support um, this as, a, as, a, as a, again, an emergency shelter until we can get people the services they need and into permanent housing, which should be our goal as a community that we're all working towards. And that's a, city, that's a bigger than a city problem, bigger than a 
certainly the planning commission's problem, but we can all do our little part, and in this, it's, it's giving the people a, a place to go uh, year round. That's just, no one should be on our streets. <coughs> so. Thank you. Yes, Alderman Steyer. Lincolnshire. Yeah, committee. I'll make it brief. Um, I was involved pretty heavily in this issue back in 2012, 13, and 14, if you remember. Uh, and I kind of came to the conclusion that a city, your city will be viewed not only with what the haves do have, but what the have-nots do not have. I just remember going on a homeless count some years ago where we uh, were on the river, and we found a gentleman in a cardboard box on the river. and. Uh, next to the river, I should say. And we woke him up, and he got up startled, and he said, I gotta get to work. And I remember going, I just, that blew my mind, if, for lack of a better description. I think one thing that came up today, and <laughs> being alders here, and I worked in the planning office for 25 years, and just understanding the need for housing. And there is a lack of low-income housing. There, there was talk over on, the Larson Green property of having some mid-level housing, and people are like, oh my lord, now what? But we really we really have to address that. So that, that's another bigger issue. But this is part of the problem that we're having now because we don't have areas to go. We spent a lot of time trying to find a resource center, let's remember, and uh, we were stymied on a couple of occasions. I won't go into all the detail on that, but, and I understand your problems too, I really do. I think we need to uh, address those accordingly as well. But uh, under the circumstances, I do support this. So, thank you. Is there anybody else questions to speak? Okay, I will. Again, close the floor. Any further discussion? Uh, Alderman, or uh, Commissioner Felton. Uh, I'm in a position to disclose again. Um, my, I'm a, a shareholder of uh, the firm at 414 South Jefferson Street, immediately across the street from St. John's. Um, we've had no problems, um, and I think it's interesting to talk about um, the problem is people sleeping under the bushes. Well, this is the solution. If there's uh, someplace better for them to sleep, they're not sleeping under the bushes. And I think that's what the shelter is offering. A person sleeping in a cot in a, sh in a shelter is safer. Uh, a for themselves, but B uh, for the community. So I would move to approve the proposal, but amend it to remove the maximum restriction. I trust St. John's to operate their facility accordingly. Thank you. Hmm. Any further discussion? I'll second the motion. Was that a motion? Yes. 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 Okay. Just so based on the capacity of the building, it's not unlimited, but it's, sure. it's within the, the restrictions codes. of building codes. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Very none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Recommendation carries. Item <laughs> 6. <coughs> Consideration with possible action and a request to create a planned unit development for the development of an apartment camp campus, 1060 Great Court, submitted by John Leroy, yep. Mall and Associates, on behalf of Gerald and Gloria Biddle, property owners. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is going to seem very, very familiar to you. And much like the comp plan amendment you had tonight, this is actually step two in the process where you saw the step one uh, earlier. Um, so just to familiarize yourselves with the property again, it's about a nine acre parcel in between North Buchanan. Uh, you have Gray Court here. This is Atkinson leading up to the highway. Uh, this is the car wash location right down here. Uh, you saw it see. Um, so uh, in March and June of this year, uh, Mr. Leroy and Mr. Bigelow came through, uh, requested a comp plan amendment. Um, for this site that's outlined in red, uh, give you a quick brief. You have warehousing on the north and the west. 
um, some single family home and some home sales as well as auto sales on the south then leading into the sort of mixed use neighborhood um, and then sort of industrial cell tower on the east. Um, so in, in March and June of this year, um, the petitioners came forward and had a comprehensive plan amendment. So what you see here in all the properties outlined in black. Um, so the frontage on Velt remained commercial. Um, also that wrapped around over to the uh, east. There's some industrial on the west side and then the core, about seven of the nine acres uh, in the center of this site was changed to medium and high density housing, uh, primarily to support six 12 unit apartment building campus uh, with sort of a pond in the middle and I'll show you the site plan in a second. The zoning out here is all general industrial, so even though the comprehensive plan recommends commercial um, uh, and some now medium high density, the zoning remains uh, uh, general industrial. Um, so this is looking to be a little bit different. If you notice, I'm going to go back to this site. So when we when we um, came through with the comp plan amendment, uh, the Belt Avenue area wide uh, redevelopment plan showed this area to remain commercial, to be sort of a large mm -hmm. commercial site, and then also the frontage along Belt to stay commercial. In order to do that, the petitioner um, willingly sort of cut off this parcel to kind of just fit his development project. Um, and then to the west um, is where his existing uh, industrial is. To do a straight zoning would be difficult because as you can see, once that uh, sort of brownish mm -hmm. color is split from the rest of the parcel, there's no street frontage. Mm -hmm. um, so that becomes problematic. Also, the remnants on the south and east side are too small for a real redevelopment. So the solution we came forward with is to do a planned unit development over the top of the property. The property lines remain the same, but the area gets divided up into three sub areas. So area A, B, and C. Area A is the, the portion that's on North Buchanan. It's currently used for uh, truck trailer storage and some warehousing. A petitioner would continue to, to do that there. So all the uses in area A would be general industrial, and it would follow that zoning even though it's under a planned unit development. Area B would have an R3 designation um, in the planning unit development, and then Area C would at this time be limited to only access uh, over the top of it to get to the Area B until such time that it can be attached to neighboring properties and make a larger developable site. At that point, it would fall into a C1 use category, use and dimensional regulations and local regulations. So to kind of familiarize yourself with this again, this was the 12-unit the apartment complex. Comes in off of Great Court. The driveway was specifically designed in a manner that Great Court could be vacated and come straight in, thereby making sort of a large developable site here um, and then allowing the commercial to remain on belt. And then as you can see what's shown in green, there would be the existing um, truck storage on the west side, which um, the owner would continue to use for that. So with all that being said, uh, we are recommending approval of the plan unit development request um, subject to the draft that's in your packet. Thank you. Sure. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. I believe we have interested parties wishing mm -hmm. to speak. Second. We have a motion and a second to open the floor. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Debbie Hamilton. I'm president of the Method Heights Neighborhood Association. I'm also uh, a neighbor. <coughs> I live about uh, nine blocks that way. <laughs> Actually, uh, square blocks that way. Um, I'm not opposed to the uh, low income or, or um, additional housing. I'm just very concerned about traffic. Um, as it stands, the uh, Belt Avenue is like, you know, trying to cross it is like Frogger, truthfully. Um, I do not turn left onto uh, Belt from Winford um, because the roundabout that's over here is just inadequate. People go down there that is way too fast. 
adding additional people to this location is going to really have a negative effect on traffic, and I think that needs to be addressed first before any further development. So, just my opinion. Thank you. Yes, sir. <coughs> John Lee with Mount Associates, former Security Boulevard. Uh, this stays pretty much in line with what we had reviewed back in May. Uh, this is going to give some very new distance to the, uh, the area. Um, some further clarification, as David had mentioned, uh, with the traffic going on to Gray Court. Uh, we have had communications with uh, Captain Gabe as far as fire goes now into the property. And uh, with keeping this uh, traffic flow the way it is, with an emergency exit going through Mr. Beagle's other property, which is industrial. Uh, as long as we have some sort of access point that could be gated, but access for a Knox box, uh, fire department will okay with that. So as we come to the actual engineering and, and finalized site plan of that, there will be uh, steps taken to go ahead and accommodate that. So if any further questions, we'll be happy with that. Yes. How much increased traffic do you anticipate? So it's 72 on units on in total. Um, as far as uh, the amount of parking stalls and garage stalls, uh, it's 72 units, it's two bedrooms. The max we would go ahead and say it would be 72 times two would be around 144 or so. Uh, typically as far as people, uh, a maximum of that. Uh, we do give it an amount of visitor parking at the property. It's not <coughs> uh, so a ratio where uh, uh, you could fit more than that on the site you could do as far as cars go. but. We demonstrated in other projects. Uh, can I give you, for example, out in Howard, we've done a, a, a large campus, 300 plus homes that just lead to one access point over on Shawano Avenue. Um, I'll grant you, Shawano Avenue is not as busy as Velp is, but it's just one access point for approximately five times as many units. And the maps, we, would, we did a, a study at the peak hours of time, morning and, and afternoon. The maps we go ahead and see out there. It's about five cars entering at one given time. With a size that's five times the amount. So it's not as though folks go ahead and all leave and rush at the exact same time. Um, yeah, so with any development, there'll be more traffic. But Valve Avenue was made to go ahead and handle traffic. Unfortunately, it wasn't designed to go ahead and be <laughs> the best for neighborhoods. It's designed to go ahead and move people fast. Once you're on it, it's great. To get onto it is not the easiest. Um, but it was meant to go ahead and handle quite a bit of traffic from downtown to the burbs. Mm -hmm. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> yes, I'll go to the I think it's normally go up for this thing. It's up to you. Stand on your chair. <laughs> <laughs> My teacher sure. made me do that. That was short. Um, Okay, I know this is an older scandals district. My district's right across the street, and I have a lot of the citizens that you know live in that area. So it's mm -hmm. a unique setup because you have a lot of residential to the south, and you've got a lot of commercial and well, not multifamily, if you will, to the north. Um, there, one thing that we did, or that was done by the city some time ago, was Lark Lark Street had gone through, and we changed that. I foresee if we have more and more development like this because you know we have a Belt Avenue plan that's calling out for a number of things. So I understand that we need to look, look at opportunities. But I think uh, one consequence from this will be differences in traffic flow possibly mm -hmm. to the south. You know, maybe you, you'll just have to, like you said, you, you can't turn left off of some of these roads. Um, so anyway, that, that's just one of the concerns. As far as the development itself, we went to some of the meetings and they were well attended. I think I'll, I'll give the owners credit that they were looking at, you know, they, they scaled back on some of what they wanted, which helped. And is it perfect? Possibly not, but I, you know, I think they're, we need to clean up this area. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. And you know, it's, it's one of the entryways to the community. So, I don't know. I generally am in favor of it, but uh, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Scannell. Yes. Uh, 
I think that um, I, I like that. I like the. I like this plan. I like. I like that it brings more density. I think if we're going to get some retail and stuff down there, we need more density. I think this does that. I think it's a good plan. Uh, I think it, traffic is a concern. Traffic has been a concern on Belt. I hear that constantly, and I think. Uh, the answer to that is we need a traffic solution. We don't stop yes. our developing. Yes. If traffic is such that there's problems on Belt, we need to look at what we can do to con you know, control that traffic or handle that traffic. Mm -hmm. So um, for me, uh, the traffic issue is a traffic issue that needs to be addressed by traffic. Uh, we should keep developing. <laughs> and I think this is a good development. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, let me just respond that I did speak with Dave Hansen, our traffic engineer. Um, the one thing he did want to point out, he's not here tonight, is that his own general uh, general industrial, the previous recommendation was for commercial, either an industrial or commercial use would generate two to three times as much traffic as a residential use. Um, so though Velt might be busy, um, the previous comp plans and the current zoning both even though it's vacant now, um, both could generate quite a bit more traffic. Um, I discussed Belt Avenue with him as well. Um, he did say this is a primary arterial road, uh, that it's possible that it's functioned more as a residential street because it had less development on it, um, but it is a, it is an arterial. Um, and it is designed to handle traffic. Traffic patterns may have to change, as I remember from as Randy Mark had mentioned. But, uh, I just wanted to add that because we were talking traffic and we did check okay. the engine. He Thank does you. not have a concern with this many units coming out of the one. Thank you. Well, Commissioner. And actually, because as far as the comp plan, like we could have put a big box store here. Do you have any idea as far as, I mean, traffic counts on that? I mean, it's a lot more than 144 cars you right. know, over a 24 hour period. Well, yeah, I don't have an idea of the traffic count, um, and we still hope to get a big box possibly on the corner. Right. Um, so, and commercial along Belt as well. Um, but I think the point that uh, Mr. Hansen brought up as well was uh, with residential, you have two core times for traffic. So between 7 and 8, 9 o'clock in the morning, and then again at 4 to 6. With a commercial or an industrial, commercial, you're going to have a constant flow of traffic. Right. Um, if it's a busy, if it's a store, um, something like that, service industry, you may have constant traffic, um, although maybe less concentrated. If it's industrial, you're going to have shift change traffic, uh, potentially, unless it's warehousing, it would probably be the only thing that would have less traffic. So um, I don't have the exact traffic count differences, uh, but commercial is highest industrial when it drops out to the residential, even more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Chair. Sure. Uh, I just remember when we were talking about a big box here, possibly one time Lisa, and we had, uh, when we were looking at Broadway, the other location, I do remember them talking about 7,200 trips a day from that establishment. So you can, you can kind of figure that somewhat mm -hmm. as well. I think one of the main um, concerns is that we do want people from our neighborhoods mm -hmm. to utilize yes. the uh, businesses on Belt. Mm -hmm. And unless we can get there, <laughs> we're never going to be able to utilize those yep. businesses. Yep. And we do want to have additional development, absolutely. We want to increase the tax base, have our residential properties increase the value, but we need to be able to use Belt. And therefore, I think a traffic pattern study should be a part of the consideration. Yes, Commissioner McDonough. I'm trying to recall the Velp Avenue uh, plan that was developed too. Didn't that call for some kind of pedestrian crossing? No, so. it wasn't not specifically, specifically that, that. No. but no. clearly this is an issue, and adding this may have the advantage of not adding too much, Just but enough adding this. enough to push forward the need for uh, that traffic control. That would certainly be my hope. And uh, when I was representing this district on the city council back in 2003, I did actually push for traffic signals at the corner of Gray and Belp, and at that time was rebuffed um, for numerous reasons. For one thing, they didn't have the roundabout back then, and it was too mm -hmm. close to the next set of signals. Right. Uh, but also, the, the redevelopment was 
in the future, and they didn't want to do much until that happened. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I agree. Now it, it may be some. There may be enough of a change that you know, my wife. But you got to remember also, this is also a state highway, and the state has to get involved in any traffic changes. Mm -hmm. So that's that alone could be problematic. Well, the state has certainly supported yeah. roundabouts. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I, I spent 21 years living on Lark, Lark Street, as you mentioned, and even when Lark did go out to build, yeah, it was a barrier to turn left, as my kids can well attest. So I, I, I feel your pain, I know exactly what you're referring to. But I, I also agree with uh, Aldous Canal that you don't stop development for traffic problems, you get traffic solutions. So that makes a lot of sense. Is there any further discussion on this? Oh, I believe at this time I'll close the floor. Yes, Alderman Lewis, please. Motion to approve. Commissioner. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to approve. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Chair, yes. I would like to add to that a, a request that the department make a formal request for a traffic solution to what we're anticipating is likely to be a problem. I don't want that to just die in this meeting. Yeah, I think we can look at that. I think Thank also you. perhaps on behalf of the elders, uh, communications to traffic commission that based on this is now the time <laughs> to be looking at opportunity for some type of control or crossing at gray so amongst thank you all of us and I just just put that specific development just wanted to thank the developer um, I, I think the project has come a long way since initially started mm -hmm. to really kind of fit in with the develop area redevelopment plan. And mm -hmm. again, you know, we kind of take things as they come and, you know, it's not exactly to the, um, you know, specifics that are in the plan, but I think the developer was willing to work with staff and then really get it in so that um, this is a good development, but there's also future development paths available for, for this corridor. Thank you. Next, informational. Uh, special meeting scheduled for July 12th, 2018 at 6 p.m. in this room. Mm -hmm. um, encore presentation. Uh, it's not long enough tonight. Um, this is looking at uh, PUD for the Whitney Park townhomes on South Hiberian Phase 4. Um, just based on timing, um, getting the notices out. And also with our council schedule, um, the developer would like to get going later this summer. So in order to get this on for our first reading at the next council meeting, um, the timing didn't quite fit with this. So if we can get a special meeting on Thursday, I promise to keep it to one item on the agenda. And then we'll be for that. <laughs> yep. The agenda's been published, so I haven't gotten it yet. Okay. Well, we promise we will promise that we'll be the only one item on the agenda. Good. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And we've got a quorum for that, right? As yes, far as the yes. responses yes. you've gotten. Okay. Yes, because I got And the date of the next scheduled yeah. regular meeting is August 13th, 2018. Correct. Mm -hmm. And the next item is the director's report. All right. So, uh, reporting back to the June council meeting. Um, we had the back up ordinances that were approved. Um, the PUD for 215 North Webster Avenue uh, for the Whitney School apartments and townhomes uh, that was approved, uh, as well as the ordinance uh, amending our smart growth plan, looking at Great Court, which was this before here today. So that's why we're starting the process for the zoning. Um, and then also just an ordinance um, uh, doing some cleanup work uh, on our regarding CUPs. I think some work uh, Mr. Buck had done just in terms of making us compliant with the ordinances or the changes that are playing plan with state legislation. Uh, and then also approved with the uh, Planning Commission report, um, you know, starting the process for the PUD South Military and Western Avenue for the uh, Martin uh, expansion. 
uh, PUD for 86 by Lombardi Avenue, which is the Tender Lodge signage, um, an approval of the Safe Routes to School, uh, Ped Bike Plan with the school district, uh, approving that, um, and then also starting the process for amending some other things with the expiration of PUDs in our ordinance, also following up on some state statutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, thank you. Sure. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Well, yeah. Motion to, multiple <laughs> seconds to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Aye. 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 Aye.